right. Uh, committee, welcome back to our last day of the corporations committee meeting. Um, we've got a, it looks like a short agenda, but the reality is it will probably go a little bit long. So I hope nobody made too, too big of plans for this afternoon. Uh, before we uh, jump into things, um, the first thing that I would like to do is today's a special day for everyone uh, because you're either a veteran or you know a veteran. And today's Veterans Day. And in typical Veterans Day fashion, we're working Veterans Day. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had Veterans Day off. <laughs> so uh, uh, a shipmate of mine uh, and Representative Blackburn, you'll appreciate this. There's a fellow Navy man in the audience here, Mr. Merklin. Um, handed me a sheet. And what we're going to do here, folks, because we've got time and because this is my last committee meeting ever, uh, we're going to take time to talk about the veterans in our lives and uh, or if you're a veteran yourself. Um, and uh, so for me, I just wanted to uh, note, I, I served from 2001 to 2006. I joined right before 9-11. So everything was really calm and cool. And then it got really out of hand really, really quick. Um, and so life changed for, for everybody. Uh, on that fateful day in September in 2001. And uh, my time in the, in the US Navy was, uh, uh, you know, I, I think anybody that was in the Navy will, will gladly say that it was a life-changing event for them. And I'm, I'm still proud of that service today. And so anyways, uh, Mr. Merklin had me this sheet. I'm, 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 I am going to make Mr. Merklin speak uh, a little bit later, but I am going to read this because I thought it was pretty fantastic. Uh, so if you'll, uh, if you'll put up with me, committee, and this is this is called "Once I Was a Navy Man," and then it goes, "I like the Navy. I like standing on deck during a long voyage with sea spray in my face and ocean winds whipping in from everywhere. The feel of the giant steel ship beneath me, its engines driving against the sea, is almost beyond understanding. Its immense power makes the Navy man feel so insignificant, but yet proud to be a small part of this ship, a small part of her mission. I like the Navy." I like the sound of taps over the ship's announcing system, the ringing of the ship's bells, the foghorns and strong laughter of Navy men at work. I like the ships of the Navy, nervous darting destroyers, sleek, proud cruisers, majestic battleships, steady, solid carriers, and silent, hidden submarines. I like work the workhorse tugboats with the proud Indian names, Iroquois, Apache, Kiwa, and Sioux. Each stealthy, powerful tug safely guiding the warships to safe deep waters from all harbors. I like the historic names of other proud Navy ships, Midway, Hornet, Princeton, Seawolf, and Wasp. Those are Cunley, Constitution, Hornet, Missouri, Iowa, and Manchester, as well as the Sullivans, Enterprise, Tecumseh, and Nautilus, all majestic ships of the line, each ship commanding the respect of all Navy men that have known her or were privileged to be part of her crew. I like the bounce of Navy music and the tempo of a Navy band, Liberty Whites and the spice scent of a foreign port. I like shipmates I've sailed with, worked with, served with, or have known. The gunner's mate from the Iowa cornfields, or the sonar man from the Colorado mountain country, a pal from Cairo, Alabama, an Italian from near Boston, some boogie boarders of California, and of course, a drawling, friendly Oklahoma lad that hailed from Muskogee, and a very congenial engine man from the Tennessee hills. From all parts of the land they came, farms of the Midwest, small towns of New England, the red clay area, and small towns of the South, the mountain and high prairie towns of the West, the beachfront towns of the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Gulf. All are American, all are comrades in arms, all are men of the sea, and all are men of honor. I like the adventure in my heart when the ship puts out to sea, and I like the electric thrill of sailing home again. With the waving hands of welcome from family and friends waiting on shore, the extended time at sea drags. The going is rough on occasion. But there's the companionship of robust Navy laughter, the devil may care philosophy of the sea. This helps the Navy man. The remembrances of past shipmates fill the mind and restore the memory with images of other ships, other ports, and other voyages long past. Some memories are good, some are not so good, but all are etched in the mind of the Navy man, and most will be there forever. After a day of work, there is a serenity of the sea at dusk. As white caps dance on the ocean waves, the sunset creates Blaming clouds that float and, float and folds over the horizon as if painted there by a master. The darkness follows soon and it is mysterious. The ship's wake in darkness has a hypnotic effect with foamy white froth and luminescence that forms never ending patterns in the turbulent waters. I like the lights of the ship in darkness, the masthead lights, the red and green side lights and stern lights, 
They cut through the night and appear as a mirror of stars and darkness. There are rough stormy nights and calm, quiet, still nights where the quiet of the mid-watch allows the ghosts of all the sailors of the world to stand with you. They are abundant and unreachable, but ever apparent. And there is always the aroma of fresh coffee from the galley, tinged with a whiff of fuel oil or jet fuel. Mm -hmm. I like the legends of the Navy and the Navy men that created those legends. I like the proud names of Navy heroes, Halsey, Nimitz, Perry, Farragut, Burke, McCain, Rick Over and John Paul Jones. A man can find much in the Navy, comrades in arms, pride in his country. A man can find himself and revel in this experience. In years to come, when a sailor is home from sea, he will recall with fondness the ocean spray on which, it, on which his face when the sea is angry. There will come a faint aroma of fresh pain in his nostrils, the echo of hearty laughter of the seafaring men who once were close companions. Now landlocked, he will grow wistful of his Navy days, when the seas were the largest part of him and a new port of call was always just over the horizon. Recalling those days and times, he will stand taller and say, once I was a Navy man. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Thank you, sir. I'm going to go next. Um, that's actually, fabulous. What's it? That's fabulous. Thank you. No, it is pretty, pretty fantastic. fantastic. Thank you. Very well read, too, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thanks. Chairman, can, um, can we get a copy of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I will definitely great. make a copy. Thank you. Um, so, members, I do want to call out, uh, because I am the chairman, it's my last damn day, I'm going to make sure we're going to spend some time on this because it's damn important. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm going to call out my good friend, Representative Jim Blackburn, a fellow Navy man. We're going to make we're going to make the Navy important today, above all else, <laughs> because we can. So, Representative Jim Blackburn, tell us of your service, of your time, and the greatest Navy in the world. Greatest Navy in the world, United States Navy, right? Well, I served in the '60s. I served on a rust bucket destroyer that was built in the 1940s that uh, did its duty in World War II. I spent a little bit of time ashore doing miscellaneous things. Um, I think I most enjoyed the destroyer. I most destroyed it. I most enjoyed uh, being at sea, uh, guarding flat top carriers that mm -hmm. my friend Sailor Lindholm was on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just getting kind of choked up here. So. Uh, I'm just trying to remember all my friends that were in the Navy that uh, are no longer here uh, and some that are. So I just, I cherish these days that we have with one another, not just our military people, but our legislature as well, because we are like a little army Navy, if you will. I, I think I'm, I'm pretty well done there, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, super appreciate you, Representative Blackburn. Um, so th for those of you that have never heard it, Representative Jim Blackburn, you, you were a boatswain's mate, is that correct? <laughs> yes, sir, I was a boatswain's mate. So Representative Jim Blackburn carries on the timeless tradition of the Navy. Um, he actually has has a, a, a boatswain's flute, is it called? Yes. <laughs> Jim plays a flute now. I'm just <laughs> um, and, and so, Representative Blackburn, um, um, I've, I've had the opportunity to hear you hear you play that, and that's one of those aspects of the Navy boy that draws you back, and it, it's sure pretty cool. Um, so, anyways, uh, I, I'm going to go to go ahead and pivot to other members now, and uh, I know we've got some other uh, veterans in the room, but we'll we'll just go down the line and. Uh, uh, tell us about your time or the time of, uh, of a family member that was close to you because we're all we're all affected by by this um, we've got a, t a timeless tradition of being uh, strong military members within the state of wyoming so we're all pretty well affected so uh chairman landon well uh mr chairman thank you for your service and uh, representative blackburn thank you for your thoughts this morning um there isn't a veterans day that goes by that i don't think of many, many years ago, the winter of 1945, and um, the infantry of the 253rd was advancing on the Siegfried Line. It was February, and it was probably about 20 degrees outside and snowing, um, and the boys had to dig in because there was mortar fire bombs landing throughout the night, and 
my dad tells the story that by about three o'clock in the morning, there was water up to their waists uh, in those foxholes, uh, but they were bunkered in. It was tough going. And the 253rd went on to uh, break through the line uh, about the time of the Battle of the Bulge. They were south of there. And it was some of the most brutal fighting in World War II. Um, they advanced uh, into, into Germany and uh, about two days into Germany, they overran a concentration camp. And my dad always said that he never forgot the sights and smells of, of that experience. Uh, as heartwarming as it was that they finally got there, um, he said it was pretty horrifying and pretty difficult for the guys. Um, you know, I, I often wonder uh, what life would have been like if, if uh, we hadn't gone over there and accomplished what we did um, with guys like my dad, who was a Purple Heart decorated veteran. Um, and he was fortunate enough to come home and uh, I'll close this up here in just a minute, but I always appreciated that he loved the Wyoming mountains. He came back and he loved the quiet. And I, I always thought it was probably because of everything that he had to tolerate over there. Uh, so grateful for his service. And uh, um, just because of timing, uh, I never, was able to mirror anything that he ever did, but sure appreciate all of those veterans today. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, we're, we're just gonna keep on trucking down the line. Um, I know my friend, Representative Duncan, has a, a proud military tradition um, to include her husband and her sons and, and uh, a long line. So Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, it, I just don't know a time that there wasn't some sort of military celebration and acknowledgement in our um, in our family. My my grandfather uh, was in the World War uh, in Belgium. Talks about his his funny story for him is that he um, attached the bombs to the planes and attached them too tight the first time and and got quite the yelling um, from the guys. Uh, and then uh, my dad served in Vietnam. Uh, came home with a purple heart and um, he's retired today after years of the uh, being a commercial pilot in FAA and um, so he's still um, loves to fly uh, even though he was a marine and then um, my husband started off as a as a navy man on the USS Mount Hood um, that's an ammunition ship and uh, then came back to Wyoming and became a CB um, construction Navy guy and ultimately switched over and became a um, uh, Air National Guard here in Cheyenne and uh, then my oldest son decided to join the against our better judgment join the army hmm. and um, it became what they call um, a cannon cocker and uh, was deployed to Afghanistan um, was there for nine nine plus something months and um, came home and uh, then my middle son went off to the Navy, um, got out, went to, uh, he was on the USS Bush, went back to college, graduated and just went back into the Navy and just um, a couple weeks ago graduated as an officer. So Ensign Duncan now um, is now in Florida, gone to flight school. So I don't, I think he's thinking about helicopters. I'm not Pensacola. Sure. Pensacola. Oh. Awesome. So yeah, so we're, we're trying to push my um, middle son into going into, um, you know, the, the Marines, because then we'd have all branches covered, but, you know, <laughs> he's, he's not listening very well <laughs> or cooperating. So, so we, we, uh, we try and, and, and take advantage of honoring um, all the soldiers and, and anybody um, at any given moment. So if you ever have an opportunity that you see someone flying or you see someone eating or something, just rather than thanking them for their service, just buy their dinner, buy their lunch, buy them a drink, do do something. If they're Navy, buy them a drink. 
if they're naked, buy them a drink. Um, but just the act of doing something like that versus um, just thanking them, it, they take that much deeper to heart than they do just the thanks for your service. Um, they, they really, it, that really means something to them when you actually do something like that. And it, just the last little bit, because I'm a, a mom and a, and a wife of um, multiple deployments. Um, my husband went to Baghdad um, in Iraq for two deployments. Um, if you have anyone in your family or your neighbor or anybody who is deployed, check in, check in on those people, mow their lawn, um, send pizza to them. You know, it's, I get choked up. It's, up. it's yeah. hard. Yeah. It's hard. And don't forget <laughs> to ring your congressman and tell them to bring our troops home. Yes. Bring your troops home. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a lot of family members who have served in the military. Myself was a little bit sickly in my younger years and I failed my reinduction physical, so I wasn't able to serve either. Uh, I do have a son-in-law who's a captain in the Air Force. Oh, wow. Uh, kind of lived all over the world and uh, drug our daughter with him. <laughs> uh, but we're proud of him because I didn't serve and don't have a lot of close family ties, it doesn't decrease in any bit my appreciation and gratitude for those who have served. Uh, driving over here this morning, I heard a little snippet on the radio about the Bataan Death March and what those soldiers went through. And uh, another, uh, experience I might share with you is uh, from 2012 to 2014, I served, I spent time in Germany. And one of the highlights, just about the time we were ready to start coming home, uh, we had an opportunity to go to the, to Luxembourg and visit the military cemetery there. Uh, General MacArthur was buried there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were a little bit homesick by then and to go through those gates and it was like we were on American soil again and see all those crosses and hear the stories of those sacrifices that were made in World War I and World War II both. Great appreciation for our country and for those who served. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. Uh, Senator Case. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you just for helping us here today because I always hate having meetings on Thursday. Um, I just don't think it's quite right, you know. And I love going to our local DFW. I love everybody there. Um, I'm losing, we're losing touch with a lot of old guys. And my grandfather would tell stories. He was an army uh, sergeant in the cavalry. <laughs> And he remembers being a boy when there would be Civil War veterans in his town. And they had mustered up a regiment that was together. And some of those Civil War veterans had uh, their hands had been hit by sabers as they were trying to hold their rifles up against, uh, you know, their muskets up against a, a cavalry charge. So I always thought, wow, that's, he was connected to Civil War people. My grandfather was born in 1887. Um, but I'm really thinking Navy today. So I'm gonna start out with my son's grandfather, whose name is Max Homick. I'm not sure I can do it, but Max Homick's still alive. He's 95 years old. I took him to the VFW on Saturday. And we had the, the uh, barbecue pork. They did a whole pork, fabulous. And Max Homick served in World War II on a, little tin can, kind of a big one. It was actually a carrier. It was a Jeep carrier called the Liscombe Bay. The Liscombe Bay was sunk uh, near the Marianas Islands, or not the Marianas, the Gilbert Islands, early in, uh, it was in 44, I believe, 43. It was sunk by a Japanese submarine. Um, most of the guys on that ship didn't make it. People that didn't make it were Max's brother, did not make it. Frank Homick, who, was, who the VFW Post in Houston is named for. Frank Holman. And another guy, Johnny Castando from Hudson, didn't make it. They had enlisted together. 
And Max was the only one to make it off that ship. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing. The loss of the Lisbon Bay. Uh, but Max is still around. I hope he makes it out to the VFW this morning for brunch. And I'm sorry to miss it. And I want to end up just slightly. Um, my brother's not around anymore. Um, he died a few years back. He drank himself to death, basically. Um, but he served in Vietnam. He was shot in the face in Vietnam. And uh, he always kind of struggled. You know, I don't think people got the help they needed back then. And I can remember that telegram coming and my mom, you know, uh, crying. I can remember going to church with my mom as a little boy and then seeing my brother for the first time when he came home for leave from Fitzsimmons. And we all, and he spent about a year in the hospital and they, they rebuilt his entire face. It was kind of a miracle. They'd actually sent up to get his high school photo so that they could have something to work his face back. And my, he was a very kind person and he took in veterans. He always had veterans living at his place and he took them in and <clears throat> was just kind to them, but he was a troubled person and he passed a few years back, but this is a big day. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's a, boy, it's a tough one, but the, this is uh this is why we do this and uh you know by golly if we got to be together and get the, the work of the people done we're going to hear from the people about uh anyways representative clem yeah thank you mr chairman um i did not serve myself i have several family members um in, in my family uh two uncles others in my family who served uh they served army um uh, my uh my wife's stepfather uh, she calls her calls him her dad because he was the man who raised uh, raised her. Thank you. But he served in in Vietnam as well, and he he passed a few years. Well, it's been twenty years now. I think seven or eight years he passed. Uh, and then I have several in our in our church, and uh, and then several close friends who have served as well. And uh, you know, I I think about that. You know, when you're when you're a young person, there's so much opportunity. And, uh, and if I had to do things over again, I think that's one of the things I'd, I'd probably do over is I'd probably enlist. But uh, just, uh, I don't have much to say on that. Just very thankful for the veterans who have served and appreciate your service and appreciate our freedom. So, uh, and, and I, I'm thankful. I am very thankful. We see, even though we've had, it seems like America is always engaged in conflict. We've had a, a period of, it's been a little more quiet. And, uh, and I hope it stays that way. Uh, war is not something that, that uh, not something I look forward to or hope for. Um, certainly pray for peace. So, but thankful for those that do serve. Representative Clausen. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't uh, serve myself, but I had a grandfather that served uh, in the Navy on the, in the Korea con and the Korean conflict. And then my great grandfather uh, citizenship. Spanish American War. Uh, I grew up around a lot of great men that were served in Vietnam and they had a huge impression on my life as a young man. And I probably wouldn't have turned out at all had <laughs> it not been for some of those gentlemen that inflicted a little more discipline on me than I probably had otherwise. But uh, no, uh, always a big thanks, thanks to those who have served and, uh, and I've always appreciated, appreciated their service. Senator Scott. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I've got a little different story. Uh, I grew up in Casper <clears throat> because of my dad's Navy service. And what happened, he had joined the Naval Reserve uh, before the start of World War II. And they... Uh, didn't take him in until 1942, let him finish his year of internship. They wanted a fully trained doctor. And he knew something about mosquitoes. So the Navy dubbed him a specialist in tropical medicine. And that's what led to, to my growing up in Casper. What happened was he was part of the team that was treating Marines that were coming back from the South Pacific, Guadalcanal, places like that, uh, 
all full of, of malaria and other tropical diseases. And part of the cure is to get them out of the tropics. So they put a hospital in, in Klamath Falls, Oregon, brought the Marines back there, and he was part of the medical team that was treating him. And he and my mother uh, liked the landscape there and liked particularly Eastern Oregon, which is very similar to Wyoming. So I was born in the uh, base dispensary at the Marine base in Klamath Falls. But after my dad got out of the Navy, he completed his, his medical training, became a pediatrician. And because of their experience in Klamath Falls went looking for a similar area to go into practice and Casper didn't have any pediatricians and there was an opening, so that's where they settled. So that service and his experience in the Navy actually led me to, to grow up in Casper. Uh, myself, I had about as little military experience as you can have uh, without having any at all. I spent a year in the Army ROTC uh, in college, but I grew over the draft standards and that was the Vietnam War. And I didn't see much point in volunteering uh, in a situation where we weren't trying to win the war. Uh, so at, once I grew over the draft, draft standards, I didn't take the second year of the ROTC. But th my dad's Navy experience was, was certainly uh, fundamental to what happened to us. And I will mention I had a great grandfather that served in the second Massachusetts. And fortunately, he missed the Battle of Antietam because he was in the sick house with typhoid. Uh, and the second Massachusetts just got shot to bits at, at Antietam. If he'd been healthy then, I probably wouldn't be here because he would have been shot there. Uh, a little scary thought as you look back into history. Yeah, well, thank you, Senator Scott. Representative Furphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, my dad was a Navy man, um, but nothing very exciting. He was in electronics. He worked on microwave kind of things. And so he really wasn't put much at risk. Um, so, but um, he certainly had a long career. He worked for AT&T for many years after he came out of the Navy with the training that he got. So that was good. Myself, um, I was in Air Force ROTC um, and uh, I passed all the phys physicals to become a fighter jet pilot. And so I was, the, the real key there is your eyesight has to be good. So I passed the eyesight exams. I was in training uh, to go forward some surgeon in Texas saw my file and I'd broken my neck playing football in junior high school. And so they wiped me out of the program. So I never did serve and I was really disappointed. I really wanted to fly those jets, but that's kind of my history. Uh, thank you for sharing that Representative Murphy. Senator Nethercott. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a long uh, his family history for military service. I'll keep it short though, um, but some interesting Wyoming stories. Also a family of uh, Navy. And my grandfather uh, was attending the University of Wyoming when Pearl Harbor happened. And he was called to Half Acre where they did announcements uh, reporting of what happened uh, and he subsequently signed up for the Navy at that time in the days after the bombing. Uh, he was assigned to the Aleutian Islands up in Alaska and defended the Alaska coast from the Japanese during the Aleutian Island campaign. He was on the ship, the Quackenbush, and we have some remarkable photos of that ship just absolutely encased in ice and snow. Uh, fortunately, he grew up in Teton County, so he was right at home in uh, miserable weather conditions during those winter months up in Alaska. 
he kept a fond love of Alaska throughout that time and would uh, commonly go back there with his wife, uh, my grandmother, who uh, was in the Women's Army Corps during World War II. And so she served in our military service as well. And I have some remarkable photos of her and I still have her army uniform and her satchel that she carried with her. As part of that service, uh, she cared for and tended, she had nursing experience, uh, many of the burn victims that were returning home um, from Europe. And so she has some remarkable letters and gifts that she received both from those um, service members and their families. And so I, I have those as well and their cherished possessions. My mother's father uh, served in World War II as an intelligence officer in Germany. And so also some very interesting artifacts from, uh, from that life as well. My father was an army officer, um, did not go to Vietnam. Fortunately, that timing of that worked out and thus I'm here today. Uh, but he did have two brothers or two sons. I have two brothers. Uh, my eldest brother, a Navy man uh, who was on the USS Seawolf, which Chairman Lindholm mentioned in his uh, in, in the opening poem and speech. It, he just completed his command of the USS Texas, which is a fast attack uh, Virginia class submarine located in Pearl Harbor, uh, which is also docked next to the USS Cheyenne, a shout out to our capital city namesake, also nuclear submarine, and of course the USS Wyoming uh, air carrier. So we have some, some strong Navy ties for the state of Wyoming. My brother is now um, a chief deputy uh, of the nuclear operations at the Pentagon. And so part of that nuclear triad here, and I get to sometimes um, connect with him on activities with F.E. Warren uh, as we continue to defend uh, our nation's interests. So really interesting. And my other brother, uh, Army Intelligence. And so uh, both of them were able to call me once uh, when they were serendipitously were not both in Afghanistan at the same time, and they called me on a satellite phone. And so that was a really special moment um, with the three of us kids, uh, both of them serving and being deployed overseas. So uh, my husband also a Marine, uh, of course the Marine Corps birthday yesterday, I've heard all about it. And uh, he's a proud Marine and once a Marine, always a Marine. So I am surrounded by veterans and I'm grateful for that experience. Thank you, Senator Nellicott. One of my favorites, Representative Andy Clifford. Thank you. Um, thank you for your service, Chairman. And I, um, I always hold um, my memory of traveling with you a little over a year ago to Washington, D.C. to talk to our Congress uh, people about bringing our troops home. And I strongly believe in that. I come from a long line of um, military families. We as Indigenous people, 576 federally recognized tribes, serve highest per capita per race in the military. Um, proud line of warriors. I wanna honor my grandfather, William Trosper, um, died in the Battle of the Bulge. My uncle Elmo served two, tier, two tours in Vietnam. Uh, tribal member, Billy Ferris, killed in Iraq. My father's a Marine, my husband's Marine, my son is a Marine. Um, my nephew, Stephen White, served in Afghanistan. Our tribal liaison for the Eastern Shoshone tribe, Lee Tendor, served in the United States Marine Corps. Um, and then I have um, a beloved Brett Grosbeck, who's currently serving in Coronado Island, United States Navy. And then I wanna give a shout out to Feather Blackburn. Um, she just now um, follow, followed in her father's footstep, Martin Blackburn, um, and she is serving in the United States Marine Corps and is um, arrived a few months ago um, to Okinawa, Japan. And also my sister-in-law, Lynette Clifford, served in Desert Storm, combat vet, worked communications. Um, and I just wanna thank her, but just so many people, but thank each and every one of you, your veterans, and thanks for doing this, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Representative Clifford. Um, last but not least, Senator Schuler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I come from a long history of um, military folks. In fact, uh, my mom, who's a big genealogy a freak. She's done uh, some history and found that we had uh, someone fight fight in every war from the Revolutionary War on from one of our family members. And so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, my dad tried to sign up um, uh, for the war and uh, he was 14 and uh, of course lied and uh, 
they wouldn't let him in and my grandparents would not sign for him. So he always felt bad that he didn't get to serve. But my oldest son um, was a Navy SEAL, um, would probably still be in the SEALs, but uh, was injured um, after a number of years and uh, was not able to uh, dive anymore uh, because of a head injury and other injuries. And so um, he was pretty sad by that because he did want to make a make it a career. Um, but uh, he continues to work with wounded vets, uh, takes them out on mountaineering expeditions with a number of other SEALs. He works with the SEAL Foundation and Wounded Warriors. Um, and so that's his way to still kind of connect with his buddies. Um, I think of them today, I think in the years that he was in there, he lost five or six of his, of his buddies on uh, different deployments uh, in the Middle East. And so I think about those young men um, and all of the, the men and the women that have served um, and just really appreciate all your service. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Senator Schuler. And I, I don't wanna forget about our unsung heroes um, for the legislature um, and they, some of the experiences they may have. So if they would like to share, uh, Mr. Hewitt. There he is. Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for, for your service. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't served myself, um, but certainly very thankful for all those who have. I um, just want to give a, a mention to a, a former LSO staffer, uh, John Roth, great guy, great friend. He served a tour in Iraq when he was very young um, and uh, great guy, great guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Ms. Katie Talbot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and really nothing to share, but um, thanks to those who serve and those family members, and um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Katie. Mr. Elliot Browning. Mr. Chairman, in the context of these discussions, I always think of my late grandfather who served in the Navy in World War II. Thank you. Ms. Daniel Creech. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, committee. I think today is a really important day. My um, family is very well-versed in the military, and my brother is a Marine who just finished boot camp. Um, my grandpa was a Marine, and um, my uncle was in the Navy. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'd be remiss to uh, committee members. I did mention uh, my favorite veteran on Veterans Day, and that's my bride. She, uh, she was, right. yeah, she was a third class petty officer in the United States Navy. That's where I found her, and then I, <laughs> I, I imported her back to Wyoming. Uh, she's a former ballerina turned jet engine mechanic on the SH-60s, and uh, she's and, a Renaissance woman. Yeah, she is. She's pretty. She's a pretty cool gal. Um, anyways, I'm going to pick on Mr. Merck. Uh, Mr. Merklin, if you could join us at testimony, Mr. Merklin. Um, got a hold of uh, me and me and the chairman about Veterans Day. And, and uh, anyways, I, he's a Navy man, a fellow, uh, fellow shipmate, as we, as we like to call each other. And I'd, I'd like to hear about your service if you could quickly, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I didn't foresee this part coming this morning. So Surprise. <laughs> uh, I appreciate each and every one of you for what you shared uh, with each other, with me, with the audience here. Uh, I'll keep it as brief as I possibly can. I've been known to talk too much all my life, so please bear with me and I hope you give me the latitude. Uh, I joined the Navy in 1964 out of high school. Uh, I spent three tours in Vietnam, one in country. I landed on July 4th, 1964 and left on July 4th of 1965. I did everything over there other than what I had been trained to do in my schooling. <laughs> probably pretty normal for my military uh, life. Uh, I did some things that I'm not very proud of. I did things that I can't talk about. I can tell you this, my unit consisted of 78 men when we landed in Saigon in 1964. When we were debriefed 
one year later in August 1965 at the uh, uh, NAFIP base in Coronado Island, which was back then known as UDT, Underwater Demolition Today Seals. We were collected into that room to be debriefed about some of our experiences over there, those that we could share, those that we could not share. The strange thing about that day, it'll be forever etched in my life, is the fact that there were, like I say, 78 of us went over. There were 12 of us in that room. 66 of us never came back. This is the Navy in 1964-65. I've been to the wall in Washington twice and I cannot find any of those 66 names on the wall. It's as if they have disappeared from the face of the earth. I know that there were some over there alive after the peace talks in 75. I know there were some still alive. They were not allowed to come home. I have had friends who were POWs in the Hanway Hilton. One in particular shared a room with Senator John McCain. This man's, uh, I talked to this man's father, or the, this man, this man that I'm talking about is a doctor with the VA. He has since retired. His father was captured in the Battle of Way and spent his time in the Hanoi Hill. He told me some stories. The VA doctors are only supposed to spend 15 to 20 minutes with each patient. I usually got an hour with this doctor when I went in to see him because we had a camaraderie, a sharing of experiences. For him, it was his family, his father. Many of you probably don't know this, but when the peace accords came down, it concerned only POWs that were detained in North Vietnam and elsewhere. The Vietnamese in their infinite wisdom, they changed the status of several hundred of our people that were over there. They changed them from POWs to detainees. They didn't have to be released. They weren't released. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm happy for those that were able to come home, but many did not, and they died over there or elsewhere. I spent two tours on the USS Canberra, which is a heavy guided missile cruiser. The missiles weren't any good, but the eight inch guns did their work. Off the coast of Vietnam, north, both North and South Vietnam, I've had the opportunity to see two sunrises one morning. One was coming up in the east, and the one that came up in the west was actually the refinery at Haiphong. We had a direct hit. We were firing on that refinery. And you could look over this way and see the sun coming up here, and you could look over to the west, and it looked like the sun was coming up over there too. We've, uh, when I was in Vietnam, I learned the language. There's different dialects over there. I was going to start this morning by saying, Chao Ba, Chao Ong, Enjoy, which means, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. And how are you? As to have learned, no, I didn't learn it, I learned a, a fragmentation of different dialects and you had to be careful where you were in the country to make sure you said the right thing because the same word with the inflection could be taken totally different. Anyway, I became a ship's interpreter on the USS Canberra. As such, I had the opportunity to be in CIC, which is the Combat Information Center. Our guns had a range of about 28 miles, firing 500 pound shells, depending upon the type of shell that it was. 
but we had uh, forward air observers, we had forward ground observers. And I remember this one particular day I was in CIC and I could hear the ground observer speaking over the speaker in, in the room. And in the background, you could hear the North Vietnamese talking. He was that close to them as far as giving coordinates to where to put the fire. He gave uh, longitude, latitude, said, wait five minutes and fire for effect. We did that, we started firing our shells. And next thing I heard and everybody in that room heard, cease fire, cease fire, you're killing us. Our shells were landing on our own Marines. We had fired the lands and grooves out of those eight inch guns to the point that they were as smooth as a baby's butt. And when they left the barrel, instead of a true tra trajectory, they started tumbling end over end. And they were landing on our men. I don't know how many we killed that day, but it was more than enough. One was too many. The captain ordered the guns lowered. We looked at the guns, and like I said, you could take your hand, and you know, it was just like a baby's butt, smooth as silk. That was over 69,000 rounds that we had fired through those guns. The crew, in a sense, was happy with respect. We we're going to get some shorter leave in the Philippines because they had to rebarrel there. We figured about a month. They had the guns out and changed out in 10 days and we were back on the firing line, firing again. I still hear those people screaming at times. I still have PTSD at times from some of the activity that I partook in against the enemy. War is not a fun thing never is. The smells of death is one that you'll never, ever forget. My son is 49 years old. He spent a tour in a desert storm with the 24th Infantry Division. They were 50 miles outside Baghdad when they returned to go south to Kuwait. They were going to get to Saddam, but they didn't get the chance. But to this day, he will not talk about the atrocities that he took part in over there. He won't, he gets, he's very angry. War is hell. Each one of us who have been served in the military, each one who has died, did so for the benefit of those who are still here. I thank you for this time to tell about this. And, uh, one thing, I don't know whether any of you ever been on a cruise or in rough seas, but I tell you what, when the waves are so bad that they call off the carrier uh, flights on the Kitty Hawk is who we, we travel with some of the time. The waves were coming over the flight deck. That's over a hundred foot high. And we're on a cruiser that's about 586 feet long with a draft of 28 feet. We're bobbing around like a cork out there in the South China Sea. Seasick green is a real color. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you that. Thank you, that thank you all very much, sir. Really appreciate it. We called it walking on walls when I was in the Navy. What's that? Sorry. We called it walking on walls when I was in the Navy. Oh, yeah. You didn't walk, you were bouncing off the ball. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a rodeo. Well, uh, and for the um, for the public that are listening in and for everybody that's here, uh, thank you for the opportunity for, for the committee to be able to do that and be able to talk about it. Um, definitely appreciate that, that opportunity. Um, now that um, 
we've gotten through that. Please thank a veteran today, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get to the people's work in the state of Wyoming. So one thing we did we did need to go over first, committee members, and uh, this motion we brought by my co-chairman. It's in regards to um, prior legislation that we had looked at in case we were going into a special session. And uh, we were gonna look at those yesterday, but never got around to it. And if you look on our agenda, um, it's uh, under uh, number 13 committee sponsored legislation for a special session. That's 21 LSO 0039 version 1.0 and 21 LSO 0038 business relief programs, nonprofits. Um, and, and so both of these pieces of legislation were brought forward in case we ended up going into a special session. And, and both are specifically built around uh, what was going on at the time, um, one of which is definitely no longer relevant, um, and that would be the business relief program nonprofits, um, because the governor did pull the trigger on, on, on handling the nonprofit. So, Mr. Co-Chairman, do you have a motion? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. I, I, I would salute the committee uh, with regard to uh, 0038, uh, the business relief programs for nonprofits. I think that uh, that effort on the part of the Corporations Committee led to uh, an executive move to try to recognize the nonprofit. You'll remember at that time, uh, back in June, uh, we hadn't quite gotten to that segment of our uh, population out across the state. And so I, I salute the executive branch for carrying that out. And I, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that that, um, that that bill is probably necessary, but I wonder if we might not want to get just a quick overview from Mr. Hewitt to uh, help us recall um, how they came about and whether or not we would want them as placeholders or if we want to forward this legislation. So, yeah, no, I think that, that'd be great. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, can you uh, go over the uh, both pieces of the legislation quickly and uh, the committee will decide on the direction then? Will do, Mr. Chairman. All right, so I'll start with 21 LSO 38 committee formal draft 1.0. And what this draft does is it amends the business relief legislation that the legislature passed in May at the special session. It was House Bill Senate File 1004. And that legislation established three programs using CARES Act funding for business relief. There was a business interruption program, a business relief stipend program, and a mitigation stipend program. And so what this bill would do is go into that House Bill, Senate File 1004, and require the Business Council to include nonprofits in the, in the program. Um, of course, the special session didn't happen over the summer, um, and the council did end up including nonprofits in two of the programs. Um, all these programs end December 30th of this year. Um, so I would agree, given the timing, if there's no if there's no session between now and December 30th, uh, I think it's very arguable that this legislation is um, is moot at this point. Any questions on 38? Questions committee in regards to 38. Seeing none, please continue, Mr. Hewitt. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next bill is 21 LSO 39 committee formal draft 1.0. And this legislation would allow boards and commissions to waive or modify licensing and performance requirements. It's actually very similar to a bill the committee sponsored yesterday, 21 LSO 40, which allows boards and commissions to, to waive examination, continuing education, and other statutory requirements. The difference is that this bill, um, by its terms, expired July 1, 2021. So it was designed to work for this year and part of next year. And this isn't as moot as the, the last bill. It, it still could have some effect if, as it's written, if you were to go into session next winter or spring and, and pass it. Um, but given that the committee sponsored 21 LSO 40, which does largely the same thing on a permanent basis, I think this draft, um, this bill uh, may be unnecessary as well. Okay, questions committee. How do you want to undo it, Mr. Chairman? Well, I think we need to have a, a motion 
um, to recall, I believe, Mr. Hewitt, is that correct? We need to have a motion to recall that legislation because we did already vote to sponsor it. Mr. Chairman, I believe it would be a motion for reconsideration and Senator Landon provided the written notice required to be able to do that. Um, assuming that motion passes for each bill, then you'd go back and vote on the bill <coughs> to pass or not pass. Can we do a single motion, Mr. Chairman, for both bills? Mr. Hewitt, can we include both bills in that motion? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I would make that motion. Uh, and I'll second it. Okay, Chairman. Motion made by Senator Case, second by uh, Chairman Landon. Representative yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I, um, I just maybe a little explanation for our public um, and, and for the rest of our committee members why we would need to reconsider this. I mean, if we didn't do any, I mean, these were these were passed to be introduced into a special session. If we did not carry through with this motion, would that mean that they would be introduced in our general session for which they were never intended? So maybe just a little explanation on why we're doing this motion. Right. So, yeah, I think I think that's important. Is it, both of these pieces of legislation are essentially timely, uh, timely piece of legislation. When we first got on this whole COVID wreck, um, number one, uh, there was an issue with some of our boards. They didn't know how to, they, they didn't know if they could properly handle that situation as far as the, the exams um, that individuals were waiting to take for their professional licensure. And uh, one that comes to mind was the physical therapist. Well, the, the, we, had, we had folks that had moved to Wyoming that were going to go to work for their trade and couldn't get their license to do their trade because, the, uh, because of COVID restrictions. And so this was a, this was a piece of legislation. Um, it was a uh, temporary licensing and permitting authority was uh, 21 LSO 39. Um, specifically to that point that uh, gave those boards that, that uh, ability to be able to handle that situation. It's very specific to COVID-19, specifically in the legislation we call out COVID-19 pand pandemic. Um, they've since been able to handle those situations as this whole pandemic continues on. The le that legislation is no longer timely. Um, and then the business relief program, nonprofits, we weren't sure if the if nonprofits were going to be able to partake in um, applying for CARES Act funding uh, that the state uh, the state legislature during our first special session in May had created programs to be able to assist um, those businesses in the state of Wyoming affected by uh, the pandemic. Um, nonprofits obviously they were suffering under the same um, the same scenario, and so that legislation would have made them. Um, a, it would have made it would have given them the ability to apply for those programs to be able to um, receive some of those CARES Act funds, and so uh, that uh, is obviously very timely. Also, however, um, through the business council, those those programs were able to uh, be able to um, put up some outreach towards those nonprofits. So that's the gist of them. Both of them are really um, no longer necessary because they've been handled. Senator Scott, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think Mr. Hewitt was accurate in describing them both as moot. Uh, I think the proper thing to do is not to reconsider them. I intend to vote against that motion uh, and uh, just let them sleep in the files that, of LSO. They were intended for a special session. They were, they were moved to be introduced in a special session. They never happened. Um, I think if we do nothing, they will simply sleep in the files permanently. And that's, I think, what ought to happen to them. Uh, me, that's certainly the attitude we took in Committee 10 with our bills. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead. And that, that's, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's that's what I was getting at is, is I don't know if we, I mean, why is it necessary to take any action at all? I could understand if these would be introduced in the general session, but that was never the purpose in which they were the, the committee passed them. It was for a special session. If a special session never happens, then the issue is 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 gone. It's 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 as we use the term mute. So I, I don't know if we need to do anything. I think it's you know that's that's kind of where I'm at. I I I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Senator Scott. So Mr. Hewitt, do if we do nothing, will these um, through the way our system works, will they end up 
being sponsored by the committee yeah. numbered, uh, during a general session? Will they be numbered? Mr. Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that yes, they, they would be numbered for the general session because the committee sponsored them. I, I understand and, and agree with Senator Scott and Representative Clem that, that they were for a special session, but for staff to take a sponsored bill and not introduce it, you know, at the next available session, that, that puts us in a position of, you know, determining uh, committee intent that I'm not particularly comfortable with. It, you know, it really is the committee's decision. And so by having this discussion um, and potentially taking further action, the, the committee can clarify in public what it wants to do with this legislation. Right, right. and I think that's important um, to note is we don't, well, well we, we, we certainly, I think everybody understands the intent of when we sponsor that legislation, we don't want to put the, our staff in the position of trying to make a policy decision for us. Um, Senator Scott, back to you, and then Senator Nemecott. Mr. Chairman, as I recall the motions on uh, all these bills, they were to introduce them in a special session, and I would think it was a stretch to interpret that as meaning the general session. I, uh, thank you for that, Senator Scott. With that being said, also this gives us uh, it gives our, our staff some comfort. I don't I don't mind going through the motions real quick, Senator Nethercock. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, the bills will not be voted on by any legislative body. Um, so, you know, it doesn't hurt to just get rid of it now, wrap it up in a nice little bow, and it's managed quickly. And for the interest of time and um, resources. I would call question on the motion to just vote on the disposal of these two bills now and it's just managed. And, and, and for the <clears throat> committee's knowledge, this first vote will be on reconsideration so that we can officially uh, lay the bills down. So this first vote will, if you would like to lay these bills back and kill these bills, I need an I vote on reconsideration and then we'll have a motion uh, on passage or to, a, a, a motion on, on tabling of the bills, either or. Um, so I and I, if, if you want. <laughs> Any question, other question on the motion for reconsideration? Question being called on the motion. All those in favor of reconsideration? Is it is it roll call, Mr. Hewitt? Mr. Chairman, it, it's it's not a final action, so I don't believe so. Um, however, you like to proceed on. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Committee members, all those in favor of reconsideration of the um, of 21 and LSO 39 and 38, please raise your hand in front of your camera. Okay, all those opposed, raise your hand in front of your camera. Motion is carried. All right, now I'll entertain another motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, all we can do is uh, re-vote our last vote on it. Right. We, oh, that's right. We can't. I don't think we can do that's a right. table because it's a motion for reconsideration. That's true. So this a, will be a final vote on these ones. Um, Mr. Hewitt, we have to do them separately, roll call, or can we do them as one? I think you got to do them separate. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, because we're going back to the, the previous motion and there were two separate motions for these bills, then yeah, I believe we have to do it separate. You have to do it separately. And you've been asked to okay. vote no. Yeah, and you've been asked to vote no, committee members. Senator Scott, go ahead. Senator Scott, go ahead. Senator Scott? Yeah, you can go ahead, Senator Scott. Can you hear me? Senator Scott. Senator Scott, if you're, if you're speaking to us, you're on mute. Well, he's got his hand still up, so I, I don't think he's hearing me. <laughs> Shoot. Can everybody so, else hear us? Mr. Chairman, just if, if yeah, go, go y'all give Senator Scott a little delay. I, I, I'm going to be voting aye for these again uh, for the simple fact that I, I don't know what's going to happen. We may have another shutdown between now and the session. If there's some reason that we would have a special session, you know, could these pieces of legislation be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I like the fact that just having the option out there, it doesn't hurt to have the option. And so I'll be voting for it. So don't know if that's enough time for Senator Scott. But that's Senator Scott, can you hear us now? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me now? The, the computer has been refusing to take my unmute. 
<laughs> I, I, I have that same problem with technology sometimes, Senator Scott. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Clem just expressed my opinion on this. I think the motion is to introduce in a special session. I don't think we're going to have one. I don't think it matters how we vote, but I approved of the bills to start with, and I still approve of them. All right. Um, any other comments, Senator Nethercock? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarity and for the public, the reason why I'm voting no on these two bills, regardless of whether or not we have a special session, I do believe that the bills are moot. Um, we just handled, as we heard from LSO, the concern regarding the emergency temporary licensing situation yesterday with our regular bill. And so that bill will be heard in the general session. And so that issue is managed. So we can put a solid check mark next to that particular issue. The second one concerning funding for nonprofits. Um, again, as we heard, the governor has already taken care of that particular issue and that funding has to be expended by the end of the year. That is underway, if not having happened already. And so another solid check mark behind that particular issue. So that's why I am voting no on these two issues as they've already been managed by the good work of our governor and this committee. Perfect. All right, question on 38. Question being called on 21 LSO 0038. Mr. Hewitt, please call the roll. Senator Casey. No. Senator Nethercott. No. Senator Schuler. No. Senator Scott. Aye. Representative Blackburn. No. Representative Clausen. No. Representative Clem. Aye. Representative Clifford. No. Representative Duncan. No. Representative Ayer? No. Representative Furphy? No. Co-Chairman Landon? No. Chairman Lindholm? No. Okay. Motion is not agreed to. Perfect. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Question on 0039. Question being called on 21 LSO 0039. Mr. Hewitt, please call the roll. Senator Case? No. Senator Nethercott? No. Senator Schuler. No. Senator Scott. Aye. Representative Blackburn? No. Representative Clausen? No. Representative Clem? Aye. Representative Clifford? No. Representative Duncan? No. Representative Ayer? No. Representative Furphy? No. Co Chairman Landon? No. Chairman Lindell? No. Motion is not agreed to. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Hewitt. Thank you committee members for your, your patience. Uh, committee members will now be going into, we're, we're a little behind schedule, only about an hour, but uh, <laughs> that's mostly my fault. Uh, we're gonna be jumping into our utilities discussion. This is a discussion of three draft bills from the broadband. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong part of the page. Um, we're gonna be jumping into our, a, uh, our utility discussion, which we've got uh, wind tax exemption repeal and customer generated electricity systems. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with our wind tax exemption repeal. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, I, I'm guessing you're presenting that piece of legislation. I am Mr. Chairman. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is 21 LSO 182 working draft 0 0.3. Spill draft addresses taxation on wind produced electricity. Current law imposes a $1 per megawatt hour tax on wind produced electricity, subject to several exceptions. One of those exceptions is for new wind turbines. Under 3922-105B, um, this tax does not apply to wind turbines for their first three years of operation. This bill draft would repeal that exemption. And you can see the repeal on page one, line seven. And then on page one, line nine, there's an effective date of July 1, 2021. On page two, I've included a staff comment for the committee's consideration. Um, this includes a couple applicability sections. One option, the first option, would be to grandfather in existing wind turbines so that they could continue to benefit from the exemption for their, three, their initial three years of operation. That is, so that's lines 12 through 16 on page two. Alternatively, the committee could consider adding language that expressly provides that the that existing wind turbines are not grandfathered in to this repeal. 
And that language is on lines 24 through 27 of page two. So if the committee would like to take up grandfathering in or clearly stating that there is no grandfathering in, uh, this, the language on page two provides those options. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for LSO committee? Questions for LSO? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, we're gonna go to um, testimony. I believe we've got uh, some agencies um, that might be out there. Mr. Petrie, I believe is connecting uh, currently right now. He's with the Public Service Commission and we'll take his testimony first as soon as he connects. Mr. Petrie, can you hear me? Mr. Petrie. Yes. We yeah. are. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Petrie. Hey, this is Tyler, uh, Tyler Winholm. Um, we're on the uh, uh, wind tax exemption. Um, do you have any comments on that, sir? We do not, Chairman. Oh, well, all right. Well, that went quickly. Does anybody, would anybody like to ask any questions of the Public Service Commission? <laughs> Nobody does. All right. Thank you, Mr. Petrie. Sorry for put you, putting you on the spot so soon. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm going to, um, we have got a, a, a pretty good pile of people here um, until, while I'm working through those that might be um, testifying remotely, I'll be adding you to the room. But until then, we have any public comment that is in the room on the wind tax exemption. Yes. Well, come on. <laughs> no time like the present. Good morning, I'm Dale Steenbergen with the Greater Cheyenne Chamber of Commerce. I guess first, just like, I, I'd like to thank every man and woman across this nation that has served in our uniform. And I hope everyone is uh, thinking about them today and appreciating the price that they have paid for this nation. Um, you know, on, on this wind tax exemption repeal, I'd like to give you a little perspective for economic development. So the state of Wyoming, the legislature, the business council has been prodding us for years that we need to go out and diversify our economy. All right, so we go out and work to find companies that are gonna bring diversification in, give jobs to kids so they don't have to go to Colorado or Nebraska to find a job or Montana or wherever. So we go out, we find companies that are interested in us. They see a resource in Wyoming with wind. And now we're turning around and saying, we're gonna make it cost, we're gonna, we're gonna remove the cost effectiveness for you to be able to do business in, in our communities. You know, um, I, I called the other day, I worked on a big wind farm project in another state about 20 years ago. And I was just talking to the assessor about what had happened off of that. And they had that same discussion about not taxing. And she said, you know, we got school buildings where we didn't have school buildings. She said, my grandson is employed in the wind, wind, wind energy industry. And I think we're making a real bad decision starting to take an industry who's, um, whose profit level is already very small and very, very competitive across this country, one that's growing and saying, nope, we don't want you in Wyoming. You know, we're struggling and struggling to find businesses that come here. Um, we get some that are interested and now we're gonna kick them out. The other thing I would share with you is that fundamentally um, when this was put, would be put into effect is extremely unfair. I always interested when we as a, as a government think that business hasn't had lined out that, hey, we're gonna build a wind farm in Wyoming five years ago, right? It's, and how do you expect them to to respond so quickly. You know, we're sitting here in the middle of a quite a terrible challenge with COVID. We need every job we can get. And I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to go visit with your businesses and talk to them about what's going on. But folks, we need jobs in this state and we need construction in this state and we need new industry in this state. And raising taxes is not a very good welcoming call to get those businesses to 
be interested in our state to continue to do, do business in our state. I get it, we're challenged financially. I think there are some things that business across the state is willing to, to talk about to do that, but to just pick somebody out and, uh, and say, okay, we're gonna raise your liability. Um, we're not gonna do what we promised to, to you. I, I, I think that's a bad move and, uh, and uh, will not bode well for us in the future. Thank you. Members, any questions? Three so didn't specifically say, but I'm guessing you're opposed to this legislation. <laughs> yes, yes, Chairman. If I didn't specifically say, we are opposed to this legislation. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, for the for the members, um, and also for the uh, for public testimony, because we do have a fairly robust list about these next two pieces of legislation in regards to uh, testifying in it. If you do hear somebody say something that you were going to say, exactly what you were going to say, um, please take that into consideration. Um, when we do, if, if and when we do get to the point where things are getting a little bit uh, behind the time, um, I will start limiting the, uh, li limiting testimony. Um, and that's not because I'm ordinary. I, I, I do want to hear from everybody. So in respecting everybody's time and, and making sure that we do get to everybody, um, we'll do that if, if needed. Um, all right, uh, any other public testimony in the room? Keep on coming. Yep, as soon as somebody sits down, or as soon as somebody stands up, rush the mic. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairs Lindholm and Landon, for the opportunity to speak to you today, and thanks to the uh, committee. Um, also, thanks to uh, all the veterans out there, and then happy Veterans Day. Um, I also would like to offer my condolences for all of you and for the family of Representative Edwards as well. My name is Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, I'm a developer with NextEra Energy Resources, and um, I'm a native of Wyoming. Um, NextEra Energy Resources is uh, the largest renewable development company in the world. Uh, we're based in Juneau Beach, Florida, and uh, we developed and we own and operate uh, the Roundhouse Wind Energy Project here in Laramie County that uh, hit commercial operation earlier this year, and the Cedar Springs uh, Wind Energy Projects in Converse County, uh, which uh, are 533 megawatts. Those will achieve commercial operation next month. Um, the, I want to take some time to highlight what we think are a bright spot for Wyoming during this difficult time this year. Um, unlike many other industries that have been severely impacted by COVID-19, we've been able to move forward with the construction and development of our projects with little to no delay. Um, we've uh, been able to keep 550 workers employed during this year on the construction of our projects, and that includes about 50 uh, displaced oil and gas workers at our Cedar Springs project in Converse County alone. Uh, we were also able to um, utilize a, a local road uh, contractor on our project who happens to be a participant in the project um, and, and he let me know that uh, the participation in, in the construction of the Cedar Springs project allowed him to keep 12 people employed this year um, in his company. And so uh, these, these workers that are employed, they're buying local food, buying local gas, staying in local hotels and supporting the local economies. Uh, you may have read recently in the Douglas budget uh, about the sales tax. Uh, hole that our Cedar Springs project was able to help fill in Converse County specifically uh, from three and a half million in June to six million in July and nine point two million dollars in August in sales tax collections um, in Converse County. Uh, these projects uh, that I described to you, our projects represent about a billion dollars. This is just next era's projects in Wyoming, wind projects in 2020, represent about a billion dollar investment in the state this year. Uh, they're going to generate about $170 million in tax revenue for the state over the life of the projects and pay about $145 million in landowner payments. Um, in the case of our Roundhouse project, uh, the primary landowners in that project are actually the state of Wyoming and the city of Cheyenne, so there's more public benefit uh, from that project as well. Uh, Next era would certainly like to grow these numbers. We have, between our wind and solar projects, we have about a $4 billion uh, development pipeline in Wyoming and uh, that we'd like to see through in about the next four years uh, that can create uh, additional hundreds of millions of dollars of tax revenue and landowner payments uh, for, for Wyoming uh, going into the future. So we're here today um, to ask that you, you ask the group not to jeopardize this future investment um, and the tax revenues 
from companies just like us on, on increasing taxes on wind. Um, the, the current wind uh, tax policy uh, starts in the fourth year of operation. Um, this isn't a, an exemption. Um, the removal of that three year grace period at the beginning is, is not the removal of a tax exemption. This is not a broad based tax. tax. It's, uh, it's simply a tax increase on the industry. And uh, Wyoming is currently the only state that play, pays three different tax revenue streams uh, from wind uh, between sales tax, property tax, and generation tax. Um, as you often know, uh, the utilities uh, request uh, power uh, in solicitations. There's RFPs that go out, and these uh, requests for proposals uh, for wind solicitations are very, very competitive. Um, the, the winners on these are, are determined by pennies, not dollars. And uh, for instance, in the latest Rocky Mountain Power RFP um, that, that uh, just closed up a couple months ago, they received 574 bids. So this is a highly competitive industry. I can actually personally speak to a project, um, a Wyoming project that lost to an out-of-state project um, in an RFP recently. Uh, this is a total apples to apples comparison. Last, lost to an out-of-state project by 40 cents. Um, so. It, this Wyoming project would have been a, a major investment in a county that could really use that investment and could you really use the tax revenue. Um, so these, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm not here to say that any increase on wind taxes in Wyoming is necessarily going to kill the project or drive all, drive everything out of state. But I know it's going to hurt competitiveness of Wyoming projects. And, and that's what it comes down to. We're, we're competing against projects in other states for these power purchase agreements. You don't build these projects without a power purchase agreement. And if your price does not pencil for the utility, the project's not going to get built. And so when we're competing against uh, projects in other states, sometimes there are our own projects in other states. Um, you know, we have other states that are that, uh, actively incentivize uh, the development of, of renewables uh, to try to get this investment in the tax revenues in their, in their counties and in their states. And we're competing against that. Right now, we're competitive under the status quo. Obviously, there's a lot of wind installations going in this year. We've gotten there, but every incremental tax in, every incremental tax increase on the industry makes the industry less competitive and truly jeopardizes uh, our ability to invest and create all this tax revenue in the state of Wyoming. <laughs> Price is the biggest determining factor. There is some uh, value to location for some of these resources, but price is the biggest determining factor. The utility, it's, this has to make economic sense for a utility. And so um, I, I, I'd also further note that, you know, I, I'm talking about this with regard to the bill that you guys are considering today, but there's, there is discussion uh, typically about uh, doubling the dollar per megawatt hour wind tax and, and uh, not to mention expected proposals to raise sales of property taxes. Power purchase agreements are long, long term contracts and um, the continued threat of tax increases on wind increasingly makes it difficult to justify putting billions of dollars here. Um, as a Wyoming native, I'm really sympathetic to the challenges, challenging financial situation we find ourselves in. And I'm proud to be a part of an industry that's providing an opportunity to diversify the state's economy and tax base. Um, wind and solar can't make up the gap. Uh, we, we know that we absolutely understand that, but we would like to be part of the solution and keeping wind and solar uh, investments in Wyoming and keeping it competitive uh, does is helping us be part of the solution. Um, Wyoming has a strong history of setting favorable tax policies that attract a diverse set of energy businesses to the state. Uh, years ago, uh, folks sitting in your place had the foresight to enact favorable severance tax policies that establish Wyoming as the top energy state and more specifically the coal capital rather than neighboring Montana. Um, we encourage this body to maintain Wyoming status as an all of the above energy leader and by keeping Wyoming wind and solar projects viable, therefore keeping hundreds of millions of dollars of investment and tax revenue within Wyoming's borders. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh boy, Representative Claus. <laughs> Mr. Fitzpatrick, so there, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fitzpatrick, so, so uh, your Cedar Springs project in Congress County, a portion of it's owned by, uh, by your company and, and then a portion of it is owned by a, a big utility themselves that you guys have sold portion and built, I assume, through contracts. Is that correct, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Chairman? Yeah, Representative Claussen, yes, not yet, but will be, yes. So the Cedar Springs project, just for some clarity, is 533 total megawatts 
uh, 200 megawatt portion of that will be sold and owned and operated by uh, Pacific Core or Rocky Mountain Power. And then the other 333 megawatts will be owned and operated by NextEra. All of it. Yeah, go ahead, Representative. So, so under our current tax structure, uh, and, and this is where I see I see some, have some difficulty understanding, and I, I may see some problem for industry and some problem for the future of wind development and in, in our utility law currently. So under our current utility law, the portion of your project that would, would be owned by the basically regulated utility and any tax burden that that uh, is hung on that portion of your project could be collected from the ratepayers and basically other states and this is basically the seven state network that uh, that that that, that uh, regulated utility belongs to. And then we have another portion in your project particular in particular, maybe uh, maybe just points out this this strangeness and how we how we go about taxing. So in your particular portion, you have to work on maybe a free market, maybe a quasi free market system and pay a generation tax that you can't push forward onto the rate payers. So it's basically you're competing in a quasi free market system. And then a portion of this goes on to who you're competing with goes into the regulated regulated monopoly or the utility system and they can push forward all of their tax all of their taxes onto the customer base so to me that's the that's the tip of the spear right here that's what we need to be focused on is how do we end up i think we have a huge fairness issue one based on the generator that has to do things by contract in a in a uh, quasi free market system that basically the utility that they're competing with has a huge advantage over them would you expand maybe on this on this relationship so the committee has a has a better understanding? Sure. Go ahead, uh, Representative Clausen. I it's, uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Um, with this, this is a, a it, it's more of a free market system. We, we for in these requests for proposals that are issued, we're we're competing against lots of other developers. Like I said, the last RFP through CIFCOR generated five hundred seventy four bids. And so we're competing against, uh, you know, wind resources in Wyoming. You're competing against solar resources in Utah, for instance. Um, and in Utah, uh, counties uh, support tax abatements to try to make those projects more competitive. So while you're saying, you know, with, we, we are not able to pass along the dollar per megawatt hour tax, for instance, to the rate payer. We, well, we are. It factors into our PPA price. That has to factor into our PPA price. We invest like a utility. We are. NextEra Energy is the parent company of Florida Power and Light as well as NextEra Energy Resources, who I work for. So Florida Power and Light is the largest rate regulated utility in Florida and actually by megawatt hours served in the country. So on our unregulated side, where I work and develop outside of the state of Florida, we invent, we still continue to invest like a utility. We have to meet a certain return. And, um, and so we will do that. We, we can't bid a PPA price uh, and power and light as well. And it's not it's below that return. Power and light. So we're looking for uh, hang on a second, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Fitzpatrick. Uh, Amy Bach, oh, Lee of Rollins. I've muted you several times now, and I'm going to ask that you keep muted. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Um, so that, that price is, you know, we, we take all of our factors into developing in Wyoming. We put that into a, a model and that produces what kind of a power purchase agreement price we can bid into these uh, RFPs and to be able to meet the return that is required uh, by our by our executive board. And so that does happen. And that increases the price. Every, every incremental increase in, in cost in Wyoming increases the PPA price in Wyoming. So if, if we are chosen, if the price still hunts and we're chosen by the utility, the utility is still passing that price along to the rate right there. Oh. One more. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is, oh, this important. is, this is important stuff. Yeah. So, so when you when you compete against regulated utility or you sell a portion of the project to a regulated utility, that portion of the project then goes into a different pricing structure. This is what this is what I'm trying to understand. So I assume it goes into a different pricing structure, and the entire thing is it falls under the regulated utilities' expenses, and the regulated utility can then bill that out as a 30-year project to the ratepayers in their seven-state system. Basically, push out any taxes with the typical nine percent return on investment. Or is there a different business arrangement? To me, this 
this is where we need to be looking at the wind power taxing structure, the wind power regulatory structure, because I think we have it wrong. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Yeah, Representative Clausen. Uh, so I, 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 as far as I, I'm not a regulatory expert, um, I, I'm not an expert in, in the Wyoming PUC, so uh, Republic Service Commission. So I, I can't speak to exactly what gets rate based from the utility perspective. Uh, all I know is that we have to factor in in our bids um, whatever incremental tax increase there may be or any incremental cost in the state of Wyoming that there may be. And price is the biggest determining factor for us. And so we as a non unregulated entity in the state of Wyoming trying to compete in Wyoming with with uh, you know other other companies whether they're regulated unregulated in the state out of state whatever um, we're trying to invest hundreds of millions of dollars billions of dollars in Wyoming and, and every incremental increase in, in cost of developing in Wyoming just makes it more difficult for us to get contracts no. Representative Clinton. yeah thank you mr. chairman and mr. Fitzpatrick, so that's right. right. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was uh, thinking about this as I was driving to Cheyenne. I have to go from Gillette down to Douglas down uh, down to here, and uh, it was kind of a, a drive on the way here. Bear with me for a moment. Uh, I was just reminiscing the first time I came down to Cheyenne, <laughs> and I have to tell you, I was having kind of these nostalgic moments until I ran a, a, across the wind farm there in Douglas because I have we've been we've been locked up and we haven't had our committee meetings and stuff. So I haven't driven that for a long time. I was actually surprised to see that. And it kind of, it kind of, it kind of soured my mood uh, through this. So I'm going to try to take the emotion out of it. Um, but I wasn't too happy about that just because it does ruin that pristine Vista. You know, you just don't have that anymore. That said, um, it's looking more and more like we're going to have a president Biden and he has been, and he's made it well known that he's wanting, wanting to transition out of fossil fuels. We'll go back into the Paris Climate Accords and green energy is going to have a robust future. I understand where you're, where you're coming from. I also understand as far as economically that you go where the resource is. We happen to have a resource called wind here in Wyoming. So I think no matter what, we're still going to be competitive just because we have the resource. Other states don't have wind, uh, not like we do. And, and with that said, why, you know, look, just projecting into the future and looking at Wyoming's economic structure and looking at where we've relied so heavily upon fossil fuels. And we're going to have to transition away from that to keep up with the times, particularly in federal policy. Why should we leave those things on the table? Why should we totally bypass wind and say, yeah, we're going to give them a pass while our other resources that we've relied heavily, heavily on in the past are, are going by the wayside? I, I'm just, I struggle as a, as a policymaker to, to leave something on the table and say, we're not going to capitalize on that. And we're not going to respond to our new environment, energy environment going on in the future. I guess that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm struggling with. I just, I don't have a justification. So maybe you can speak on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Um, Representative Clinton. Yeah, I, I, it's a great point. I, Wyoming has responded. We're the only state in the country that has three different taxes on wind. So that, that's already there. It's, it's not leaving anything on the table at this point. Um, we, we've, uh, ever since the generation tax was instituted about a decade ago, uh, there's been very little wind build in Wyoming until this year. It took a long time to be able to catch up on that. Um, and there's, there's a, a lot of wind build going on this year. We've, we're able to be competitive. And um, Wyoming has, is blessed with lots of natural resources. Wind is one of them. Uh, Wyoming isn't, doesn't have the market cornered on wind. Um, I, it's the high or the low air density here. Actually, you know, the wind blows hard here and it's, a, it's, it's an exceptional wind resource. There's no doubt about it, but with lower air density and high elevation of Wyoming, you actually, it's, it generates a little less power than it does in other states with, with uh, higher air density. And so it's, it doesn't have the market cornered on wind and we're competing against solar now. And so solar, uh, when, when you look at some of the exceptional uh, solar resources, especially in Utah and Southern Utah, as you start to move towards the desert Southwest, these, these, are, these are projects that we are competing against in Wyoming. Um, Wyoming is now and likely continue to be for a long time an energy export state. And so we, uh, we have to compete with other states uh, for these investment dollars. And so, you know, right now, wind is being taxed in Wyoming and we've found a way to become competitive and we've been able to become competitive. And like I said, an increase in tax, I don't know if it's gonna drive, if it's gonna be a project killer. Um, 
I, I don't like the idea of increasing taxes on one industry uh, like that in general, but I don't know if that would be a project killer necessarily, but price is the determining factor in, in achieving a power purchase agreement. And when, when other states are competing for these investment dollars and the tax revenue and the other benefits that come from it, the other investments that come, um, you know, a lot of communities in Wyoming have invested in technology parks, for instance, to try to attract uh, data centers and, and other uh, kind of tech companies to locate in their communities. Well, those companies are attracted to renewable energy and what, whether anybody likes it or not, they're, they're attracted to renewable energy. And those are additional large investments in Wyoming that potentially follow renewable investment in the state. So, I, you know, I, I don't think that the state's leaving anything on the table to answer your question. I think that the, the state is, is get, getting some tax revenue from wind and will continue to. And if, if we can continue to invest in the state, then we're going to generate additional tax revenue. If, if we're priced out of the market, then, you know, nothing's going to come. Right, thank you. Further mm -hmm. questions, committee? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Mr. you Mr. very much. Okay, further public testimony in the room. Not seeing anybody in the room. Okay, we're going to go to uh, my my list here, and and, and for um, <laughs> for those folks that are in the waiting room, if your name is uh, if you're on the list and you want to testify on this, and you're wondering why you haven't been admitted into the room yet, I'm trying to go through the list, but some of you are named. Uh, something that is not on my list, such as 4G or uh, 006287. That did not sign up to testify. Uh, I, so I need a first and last name. If you're in the waiting room and wondering why you're not in the room yet, uh, please uh, change your name so that I can recognize you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. just, just as a, as a to interject real quickly, uh, it looks like we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 27, 28, maybe 30 to testify. So that's just a heads up to all who are going to share some thoughts with us today. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Be brief or not. Either or we'll listen to you. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to Cindy Delancey first. Miss Delancey, are you there? I know I let you in. Miss Delancey. Well, might have to come back to me. Oh, there she is. Ms. Delancey, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it uh, wasn't letting me um, use utilize my controls. So thank you, and I appreciate for the delay there. Um, first, I want to introduce myself. Thank you. My name is Cindy Delancey. I'm with the Wyoming Business Alliance, and uh, I'm so um, incredibly grateful for getting the opportunity to listen to the committee speak this morning, um, you sharing your personal experiences and reflections of um, Veterans Day was incredibly moving and really a meaningful way for me to start my day and just really wanted to thank the committee for their candor and um, kindness in, in a lot of the words and sharing your uh, inner thoughts with, with us this morning. It really brought me back thinking about members in my family who have served and are no longer with us. And uh, it, was, it was a really nice way to start the day. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing that time on your agenda. Moving on to the matter at hand, um, I wanted to um, give you some comment related to how the Business Alliance views the draft legislation before you this morning. Um, we are in opposition to the legislation. I will keep my comments brief as we've heard um, some things that I wanted to touch on already being said by others, but um, how we came to that conclusion, um, our membership is very diverse. We have uh, big members, small members, members from every sector of Wyoming's economy. And so we, we defer to our guiding principles. And our main principle is that the Wyoming Business Alliance supports public policy and legislation that enhances a sound business environment and promotes economic diversification. We do not support adding regulatory barriers or additional burdens on business in Wyoming. We see this uh, uh, removal of the um, established uh, pause in collection of the generation tax as an additional um, burden on business for some of the reasons stated by our industry experts as well as Mr. Uh, Steenbergen. So with those guiding principles, you know, we, it, it, I just asked the committee to really look at the situation for what it is. 
This might look like a step forward as far as a revenue enhancement, but it really is taking potentially two steps backward. And what I mean by that is if the exemption were to go away, sure, there would be the imposition of a new tax on an emerging industry that would generate some production tax revenue, but we also could stand to lose the other two revenue streams at the same time. Um, the net sum of zero is zero. And uh, as already articulated, there's three uh, revenue sources that come from the wind energy uh, sector of our economy, sales, property, and generation. If these projects are built, we collect none. And I know Ms. Choquette is scheduled to testify, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but I really have been reflecting, and I'm sure she's going to discuss some of the numbers that are eye-popping that, a gen that her project would generate. She gave a very nice presentation to the Minerals Committee, which I know some of you serve on. And when you look at the potential taxes collected from a project of this nature, it amounts to $1.160 billion. If we uh, take steps that could thwart the development of some of these projects on the horizon, we not only lose the potential of uh, getting the production tax, we lose all the taxes. And right now, I think that 1.160 over the life of project certainly seems to be something that Wyoming could benefit from. In addition to losing the taxes from the specific wind projects, the business, the ancillary businesses that benefit from these projects in our state lose as well. That's the hoteliers, the restaurateurs, the tire salesmen, the mechanics, the electricians, all of that um, supply chain that uh, plays an important role on bringing these projects online, they lose as well. These projects are often built in rural, rural parts of our state. You know, there's not very many wind farms uh, in municipal areas. And to have that uh, benefit for jobs and sales tax revenue coming from uh, some of the um, supplies that are necessary and needed in the construction of these um, projects would also be a loss. We've, we've heard a lot, we've talked about a wind, wind tax for going on a decade now. We've all learned a lot about these, uh, this particular sector and emerging um, piece of our, our, of our Wyoming revenue stream from our industry experts. When they say that, that this could be uh, a real impact to the future of their projects, I encourage the committee to listen to them. I think they come before you with clean hands. They don't, um, they wanna see these projects built and they don't wanna be deceptive or misleading. I think there's a genuine uh, sense of trying to give some honesty as far as a consequence if this policy choice um, by our elected officials is pursued. So knowing that the margins are, are very slow and that there is a potential risk of, of not just losing the production tax, but losing all the taxes, I just really ask the committee to please keep our options open. Uh, we've got you know, some changes ahead on the horizon as far as what uh, the future of energy perhaps might look like uh, as we move into the next four years. And by having um, all our options open really positions Wyoming to be at its best. So for the reasons stated, we just uh, stand in opposition to this legislation and um, ask that you um, vote no on it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the Wyoming Business Alliance? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Lancey, appreciate your time. Thank you, have a great day, appreciate you. Our next, uh, Mr. Cox, are you available? Mr. John Cox. If you are, please turn on your video and your microphone. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm, uh, I'm on. It says I was not allowed to put on my video, but now I'm, I'm here. Um, I, I will uh, be brief recognizing uh, the many other <clears throat> folks who are, are going to testify. One thing that I did want to mention that uh, had been brought up in a, a previous discussion about Rocky Mountain Power, um, what was a recent action that had occurred in, in a neighboring state. So I did at least want to address that. Just as a brief background, Rocky Mountain Power, as was mentioned, uh, is uh, a, a utility that operates in three Western states, uh, Utah, Wyoming, and uh, Idaho. Uh, we have a sister utility on, uh, in uh, Oregon and Washington, and just a sliver of California uh, called Pacific Power. Uh, altogether, those, those six states, um, we, we serve them from, from all of these different resources. It is helpful, though, to note that about two-thirds of our electric load is uh, from Rocky Mountain Power states. So 
uh, and about one third of that is, is Pacific Power State. So two thirds of, of the electricity consumed is consumed in Utah, um, Idaho, and Wyoming. Um, the item I wanted to flag was um, a few months ago, uh, we did have a, a regulatory uh, order from uh, one of those public service commissions uh, in, in Utah. And it was about our integrated resource plan. And uh, they acknowledged the plan, but they did flag a concern that, uh, that they didn't want us to address. And, and that was, they, they felt like um, as we talked uh, and, and uh, planned for potentially more wind in Wyoming, uh, they felt like uh, perhaps we had not appropriately addressed uh, or suffic uh, sufficiently priced into our, our modeling uh, potential increases in the Wyoming wind tax. And uh, we, we obviously have priced in existing wind taxes. Wyoming is the only state that, that has that in, in our system. But uh, their concern was that um, every year we, we have this discussion and uh, at some point in time, uh, potentially there, there will be an increase. And uh, they, they didn't want um, th those customers in, in Utah to, to be paying for that um, if, if perhaps there was another project that could be built um, at a lower cost. Um, I, I share that with you again, similar to, to Mr. Fitzpatrick, um, not, not as um, a threat by any means, because I, I, I know that uh, Wyoming wind had not been built for several years um, with that wind tax that was instituted, you know, about a decade ago, uh, but we are building it today. Um, it, is, it is in our customer's best interest to do that, even with that wind tax. And so um, obviously markets evolve, uh, markets change. And uh, we, we certainly see a robust interest right now in building uh, new resources throughout our state. Uh, some of that is in Wyoming, some of that is in, in our other states. And uh, we look forward to, to perhaps having um, certainty uh, on this issue and others down the road on, on just what the rules of the game are um, so that our, our customers can, can plan for that. Um, just one last thought, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it was mentioned uh, as well incentives that, that other states often have. That is absolutely true. Um, and, and, and specifically as it relates to, to just next door in, in Utah, which is sort of the prime competitor with, uh, with Wyoming wind. Uh, many counties in, in, in Utah, particularly Southern Utah, will uh, have tax abatements um, in the 60 to 70% range of property tax. Um, and then as well, the state does have just a very small uh, production tax credit for uh, large scale solar projects. Um, so, so uh, you know, every state discusses these issues. Um, obviously, no, no current legislature can bind a future legislature, but uh, these are issues that are playing out in real time. Um, the benefits um, are existing uh, Energy Vision 2020 project that uh, some of it will loan, but uh, also uh, some of it will be owned by others. Uh, we'll bring in uh, approximately $70 million in sales tax revenue. Uh, approximately $11 million in uh, property tax revenue, and then approximately $3 million in wind tax revenue. So again, the only state with those three taxes. Um, as we analyzed it before, um, the, the kilowatt hour, the, the tax or, or, or cost per kilowatt hour uh, as it relates to tax um, is significant. And at a future meeting, I'm, I'm happy to, to share that as it relates or compares to other resources uh, in our mix as well. But uh, recognizing our time is short, I'll perhaps leave it there and answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Cox, Representative Quasson, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Cox. So, uh, so under the Rocky Mountains, this, this is a portion of the, that, that I don't have a big understanding of, and uh, I think it's where this committee needs to look. So under, if the Rocky Mountain Power System owns a, owns a project themselves, they, they build the whole thing out through the repair, any taxes, any expenses over, over time to, the, to their seven state system. When you contract to a to a, a third party system, or we'll call it a quasi free market system, they're not allowed to uh, to bill those those taxes out. So, so how can you how can you find a third party system? How can they be economically competitive compared to uh, say the Rocky Mountain Power System owning the whole projects? I guess that's the the tax structure is one part of the question, and then the long term competitiveness I I think is that is another part of the question. Mr. Cox, go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Claussen, um, the, the way that would work out, so it was mentioned that we have a, an RFP going on right now. The, the way that that would work out is, you know, these projects that we're talking about wouldn't be built until, you know, the 2023, 2024 range. And in that scenario, if the Wyoming tax uh, law changed, you know, the, the price of that PPA, their, their bid, um, you know, essentially changes as well. So, so it's an issue of cost competitiveness with um, other projects, perhaps in, in other states. But for Rocky Mountain Power to own it, we would be paying that tax just like a third party. 
The difference with the third party is it just gets sleeved through that PPA with a higher price. Further questions? Okay. Well, Senator Case. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Mr. Cox, welcome. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have two questions. Um, they kind of relate to things I think that there's a little smoke and mirrors that goes on and I want the committee to be aware of it. Um, one is the uh, that our current production tax is responsible for the lack of uh, wind development for several years. And I would venture to advance that the real reason for the lack of wind development is transmission constraints. And so I'd like Mr. Cox to tell us about his company's efforts in the transmission area, not just to build new transmission, Mr. Cox, but I'd also like you to explain how you operate coal plants differently now as a company and make, and, and that that frees up transmission capacity. And you, you alluded to the fact that maybe the tax prevented new development, but then of course you, you agree that there's lots of development on the horizon right now. I'm advancing that it's due to transmission constraints more than our existing tax. And I'd like to know what your company has done both operationally to make transmission available and to create new transmission. Mr. Cox, please go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Case. Uh, Senator Case is is, uh, is absolutely right. The transmission is a significant impediment to these types of projects. Um, as it relates to our, our current project, the EV uh, or Energy Vision 2020 project, there was uh, a significant amount of new transmission built to accommodate that, that new wind, um, uh, just a little over 100 miles of, of new transmission. With our proposal to, to continue building uh, new, new resources, uh, potentially in the state of Wyoming, um, our Gateway South transmission line uh, is a 400 mile transmission line um, in uh, Southern Wyoming, Southeastern Wyoming. It would cut through uh, Colorado and then connect into to Utah in our broader system. And so, yes, absolutely, you are, you are correct, Senator Case, the cost for transmission is significant and that can be a barrier to, to development. Uh, one way in which we're helping to, to buy down that, that cost um, is through the, the existing federal production tax credits. Um, and, and, and those uh, are uh, currently set to, to eventually go away. They, they, they reduce over time. And so it, it is a way to, to help pay for these projects to, to make them more viable, um, not just the wind turbines themselves, uh, but uh, absolutely as well with the, the transmission. To your second question, Senator Case, uh, we do operate our coal plants differently today than, than we have historically. Uh, and that's not uh, necessarily to, to accommodate just a, a new resource, but also as it relates to connecting to the broader Western market. Um, what, what happens uh, in, in the Western grid in particular with solar, uh, and, and we see this because of a significant amount of production of uh, in particular California solar, that you can buy uh, renewable energy very cheaply on the market during certain times of day and certain times of the year. And so as a result of that, it's in the, the best interest of our customers, we found, to at times of the day, reduce our coal uh, generation capacity and to take on that, uh, that renewable energy at very low cost. In some cases, uh, and, and, and this is rare, but in some cases during some times of year, it's even negatively priced. Again, I mentioned those incentives from other states. You can see a state incent this development so much that it makes sense for them to uh, sell it to you at uh, very low prices, uh, next to nothing at, at some hours of the day. And, uh, and so, yes, we, we do uh, operate our coal plants a little bit differently than, than we used to, uh, to accommodate those that, that, that lower price uh, energy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And one more, if I could. Yeah, follow up. go ahead. Um, it's in a slightly different area. You'll hear today, and speakers have already re re responded that uh, Wyoming's the only state that has these three taxes on wind. And you know, it sounds like these three taxes on wind, these three taxes on wind. But no one's really providing a quantitative uh, connection of the size of these taxes and the total tax burden um, with respect to wind versus other resources. And just, you know, I wanna caution speakers about that. And uh, uh, I think that, you can kind of count on the utility to do the straight, give you straight poop because they have to live here. And so, uh, Mr. Cox, I, can you comment on the differences between state policies with respect to taxes without relying on your 
the three taxes that we have that maybe other states don't have those three, but they have levels of taxes that uh, may be higher than Wyoming. We learned in Montana, for example, that they have local impact fees. Other states have uh, a tax on corporate profits, which would affect utility owned resources. So it's not a simple thing. And I just want to caution people not to so sloganistic to say Wyoming's the only state that has those three. And I'd love to give Mr. Cox a chance to comment on that because you can count on utilities to tell you the truth because they are kind of regulated things and they're here for the long haul. Mr. Cox, please. Mr. Chair, Senator Case, uh, you, you are right. The uh, taxing uh, levels and structures differ by state. Uh, that, that is absolutely true, uh, Senator Case. And um, you, you mentioned a corporate income tax uh, as an example. We certainly have that um, in, 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 for example, the neighboring state of Utah and, and, and others, while we don't in the state of Wyoming. Um, I, I do think it's helpful, though, to, to think through sort of what the objective is. And if it's um, sort of fair taxation, I, I think that type of analysis is very helpful to, to compare state by state and, and analyze um, you know, what, what, what perhaps is, is equitable um, as, it, as it relates to that comparison. The, the other lens perhaps to look at this is through you know, whether or not you're trying to attract these types of businesses. And, uh, and, and some other states will have sort of incentives as it relates to, to, to this type of generation. Um, and and, and that, that can certainly be attractive to some of these developers. But you're, you're absolutely right that, that the taxing policy is different state by state. We go through that process with our public service commissions um, and, and make sure that, that folks are treated equitably um, as best we can. And, and uh, you know, this is no exception to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Yep, Senator Scott. Mr. Chairman, uh, following up on Senator Case's question, uh, you'd specifically mentioned about some property tax abatement in, in Utah. Uh, my understanding is that Utah has a significantly higher property tax than, than Wyoming. Um, can you tell us for this type of, of industrial property, how the Utah property taxes compare to Wyoming before you consider that abatement you're talking about? Yeah, uh, Senator Scott, off the top of my head, I, I, I perhaps can't do that uh, as well as I would like. Um, so, and this goes perhaps to Senator Case's comment on differences between states. I'm, I'm happy to follow up afterwards and, and provide that type of information for you. Uh, I'll add just one more uh, bit of nuance as well. It is different county by county in some of these, these states. The Utah example, you do have counties that start to compete against each other. And what began as a very small abatement uh, quickly grew. And, and, and you can argue whether that's in the best interest of that county or not to, uh, to, to ultimately give away much of that property tax resource. But, but as far as the comparison, I'd, I'd perhaps need to, to do that research to give you the, the, the adequate response. Any other questions? Representative Plossen, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cox. So the, so the regulated monopoly system was basically set up to you build one giant generator or several giant generators and then split the cost over time. And that cost is split out over the ratepayers. When you go into a, to a, per, or a power purchase agreement for, for let's say uh, wind power that's intermittent, how does the utility profit or basically keep the doors open if, if they're purchasing their power and not billing for the long-term utility and then or the, or the long-term infrastructure that's there. And so, that, so that's the way the, that our current structure was kind of, our current system was kind of structured and the public service commissions allowed uh, allowed expenses or disallowed expenses in theory over time and the, and the whole thing was paid for. When you go to a third party and do a per purchase power agreement, basically the, the utility stay afloat and what's the incentive to actually do that? Go ahead, Mr. Cox. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair and <clears throat> Representative Claussen. Um, so the, the utility business model essentially is that uh, in order to earn a profit, you know, the, 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 that uh, I, I have to own that asset. So if I don't own the asset, uh, essentially it's treated much like a you know, fuel expense. So it's sleeved through to, to our customers, uh, but there's, no, there's not a, a profit there uh, in quite the same way. Is, is that getting at your specific question, Representative Claussen? Mr. Chair, absolutely. Yep. Perfect. Um, any other questions for Mr. Cox? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Cox.
Thank We're going to now go to uh, Ms. Kara Choquette. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. My apologies. Um, and for the members that are in the waiting room that possibly haven't been allowed in the room yet, I am uh, trying to monitor that and uh, admit you when I when I do recognize a name uh, that is on my list. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. I'm says you cannot start your video now. It now it does. Hi. There you go. Perfect. Let her buck. How did you know? I was the perfect person to follow up on that conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to comment. Um, again, for the record, yeah, my name is Kara Choquette. I work for Power Company of Wyoming, LLC, and TransWest Express, LLC. These are independent energy companies who have been working very hard in good faith for um, 12 years now to make these projects happen for Wyoming. Um, before I go into my prepared remarks, I would like to address the question that was just brought up. Um, about what other state taxes and what the impact is. That work has been done. It has been presented to the Revenue Committee. It was done by the University of Wyoming, who I would expect you all would agree, that's a trusted institution that would tell the truth based on policy matters. They did an analysis looking at all of the state tax burdens in the 11 Western states where our projects would compete. They looked at in a study that again was presented to the Revenue Committee by the University of Wyoming that when you consider all of these various factors, the property tax abatements here, the lack of a sales tax there, the, the taxes paid by state include Colorado is $1.57 per megawatt hour. Montana is $1.82 per megawatt hour. Utah is $2.57 a megawatt hour. Idaho is $2.57 a megawatt hour. Arizona is $2.88 per megawatt hour in state taxes. New Mexico is $2.94. And then you get to Wyoming at $3.05. So this is a study that I'm, I have planned to reference in my remarks, but I think is really important to, to follow on uh, perfectly with that conversation. Um, I would encourage you all to take a look at it. It was published March 7th of 2019 presented to the Revenue Committee in July of 2019 for over two hours. They walked through this study and the analysis and showing at the end of the day, and I'm skipping ahead here a little bit, at the end of the day, this idea that Wyoming is the least cost state to develop wind is simply not borne out in the data and in the analysis. The least cost state, if you were a wind developer starting out and looking across the 10 Western states, or 11 Western states, um, New Mexico is the cheapest. It's about 10% cheaper to develop a wind project taking into account all of these costs and burdens than it is in Wyoming. Wyoming is the fourth least cost after Colorado and Montana, or perhaps it's Montana and then Colorado. Either way, we are not the least cost state. And I think that's really important data that this committee should review and consider before you might make um, any decision on increasing taxes on wind. Um, let me go back to where I planned to start. And that was kind of three main points that I really appreciate. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear a lot of these points have been made, so I'll be as brief as possible. Um, first of all, what you think you know or what you understand about the rate regulated um, load serving utilities like Rocky Mountain Power is very different from what we're facing as an independent power producer. So please don't apply your thinking about that to what we're trying to do. It's, it's just not the same business model and that's, that's come out here today. Um, we are independent energy developers. We have no captive customers. We have no guaranteed service territory. We have no guaranteed rate of return. So we are a utility by NAICS code and certainly how uh, wind firms are taxed in Wyoming by the Department of Revenue. As a department assessed non-mineral taxpayer, we're included in that utility class, but we're not a utility by business model in the way that I think this committee typically thinks about it. Um, second, and again, this was highlighted earlier, uh, you know, calling this the wind tax really miss, uh, sends this impression that that's the only way that wind projects are taxed in Wyoming. And the three big forms are property taxes. That's the cake. That's where the bulk of the benefits come. Property taxes are predictable, dependable, non-mineral over time. The Craig report just talked about how non-mineral uh, property tax base is so important. Then there's also the sales and use tax, and then there's the generation tax. So all three of these things are working together. They're scheduled, if you will, in some way to assure that there's revenues up front and over time to address impacts. So um, I also wanna point out that this wind tax, as it keeps on being called, 
is really a tax on electricity. So let's be very clear about the product that this is taxing. And this current $1 is taxing the product at a wholesale level. So our product as an independent producer, as a wholesale, no outlet to, um, we cannot, our, our product is useless essentially until it's passed through, or I think Mr. Cox used the phrase uh, sleeve through, through a utility. So the wholesale product is already taxed. And then when it goes into the retail market in Wyoming, that retail sale of electricity is already taxed at a 6% sales and use tax rate. So this unit of production that's, that's being taxed is already taxed at the wholesale and at the retail sale level. Um, the other important point I wanna make as again has been alluded to earlier, this is not just about removing an exemption. Exemptions typically apply to broad based taxes like an exemption from paying a sales tax or an exemption from paying a property tax. <laughs> the tax on wind generated electricity is only imposed on wind projects. So this is not a broad based tax to begin with. Um, and it's certainly, when you look at exemptions, the idea, right, in general, is to provide a, um, an incentive. You're trying to attract a new business or um, provide some benefits to get a new industry. The entire purpose of the wind tax, the wind electricity tax, was not intended to be an incentive. In fact, a former legislator told the Casper Star Tribune in January 2019 that in his view, the whole electricity tax was imposed to, quote, throttle the wind industry. Throttle is choke or kill. That is uh, not an incentive. So the three year period before the generation tax applies was really a policy decision that legislators made at the time in part recognizing this huge upfront tax that had just been reimposed uh, on wind projects by removing what was very clearly an exemption. So the sales and use tax exemption was removed on these projects. So. If the legislature now removes this three-year period, it's not a means of bribing the tax base. As Ms. Delancey alluded to, it actually narrows the tax base because it increases the risk a project like ours can succeed in Wyoming. If we can't be viable, then we're not gonna be there to pay the $1.1 billion in estimated revenues we would provide through not only the wind farm, but the whole other project that we're working on, which is the Trans West Express Transmission Project designed to help connect Wyoming to new markets. So again, a huge reminder too, we're not competing with Wyoming coal. We're trying to get to a new market that doesn't exist for Wyoming today in the form of electricity. This is not an area that Rocky Mountain Power directly serves today. So thinking about this issue just in the context of Rocky Mountain Power is not fair to the rest of us who don't have that business model, who don't have those market opportunities. So the other thing I heard on Monday, and I really appreciate this as well, is that how dedicated this committee was to transparency and issues of, um, uh, history and context. And so I think I'm the only person on this call, maybe a few others, that has participated in this wind taxation issue since it began in 2009. So if the committee and Mr. Chairman, if you please indulge me, I think this history and context is very important as you consider this issue today as to how we got here today. I will, I will definitely indulge you, uh, Ms. Choquette, but please also know there are about 20 people behind you and uh, there's a stop clock as it stands right now. I, I appreciate that. But again, this is a critical issue and I know this committee wants to make decisions based on evidence and data. So let me just say, this is the 15th meeting, the 15th legislative committee hearing that's been discussed, the topic of increasing taxes on wind energy in some way. But I go back even further than that to 2008 when we started our project development. When we started our project looking to do business in Wyoming, the only tax that we had to pay in Wyoming at the time was property taxes. That was about $377.5 million. So we filed a right of application. We're on a private ranch that our parent company owns. We're a long time and trusted investor in Wyoming. We have long time history of investing in this state, not only through what we're trying to do through wind, but also agriculture, hospitality, and the oil and gas business that you know us best today, over 60 years of development history in Wyoming and showing and demonstrating to the state we are a committed investor and in trying to do right for Wyoming. So, and then we started our project. We're trying to get this project going. We announced public scoping, we have our meetings. And then in 2009, the legislature decides to remove the sales and use tax. That added $234.4 million to our cost to do business in Wyoming. At the same time, and I won't bore you with all the details, there was a series of huge meetings held by the legislature, members of local governments, industry, 
the Wind Energy Task Force that comprehensively studied all issues of taxation and regulation as it relates to wind in Wyoming. I was at every single one of those meetings. By the way, most of the other wind developers at those meetings are not here today. All of those projects that were talked about and discussed have gone away since that time of the wind task force. And it might be, yes, the University of Wyoming study looked at this in part due to lack of transmission. It's also the taxes and it's also the regulation. The wind tax, uh, wind electricity generation tax was added in 2010 without doing any of the study that the wind task force had recommended. They recommended that any burden proposed be calculated to maintain some competitive advantage for Wyoming's wind energy producers as they deliver electricity to distant markets where demand for our product exists. Also in 2010, by the way, there was a whole round of new regulation that passed. The county regulations got harder. The state regulations got tougher. It cost us almost $100,000 just to apply for the industrial siting council permit. That doesn't count all the work and all the money that you do to prepare the permit and gather all the data responsibly to, to address all that's required of the industrial siting team. So that gives people an avenue. If you don't like a wind farm proposal in your community, there's county regulations that you can turn to. There's state regulations. If you're like us on the federal side, there's also opportunities to participate in the public process from a federal level. So the use of tax policy to try to throttle wind projects is just a misuse of tax policy. There's a whole regulatory regime the legislature very carefully looked at and established and put that into place for the citizens of Wyoming to use. In 2011, um, again, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would beg your indulgence to continue providing you with the data and analysis that the Revenue Committee has heard over the years. It's you. why they have continued to vote this issue down ten, nine times over the past several years. Um, there's data and evidence that backs up all of these decisions. And I think that's important for you all to consider today. I'll let you wrap up, go ahead. Well, <laughs> let's just say we walk through every single issue, every single reason that people could give for trying to increase taxes on wind energy. We had demonstrated that wind actually pays more per megawatt hour in uh, than coal or gas does in Wyoming based on the, the LSO's analysis. You've demonstrated we paid our fair share. The University of Wyoming has done two studies that look at the benefits that Wyoming would receive far outweigh what could happen if projects like ours aren't able to go forward. We've worked to develop a federal royalty sharing re resolution that would provide more money from our project on federal lands to go back to the state. We've um, done an analysis of how much our project would provide in terms of taxes to Wyoming per employee. We were told at one point we have to be taxed more because we don't cover our employee costs. Yes, we do. Each employee would pay approximately or lead to $148,000 per year in tax revenue for Wyoming when the cost to provide services is $30,000. Um, this idea that somehow Minnesota has a generation tax, so Wyoming should too. Well, Minnesota doesn't have property taxes or sales and use taxes. We looked at that analysis. If the Nevada tax regime existed in Wyoming, we'd be paying half as much in taxes as we are now. Um, every meeting of 2019, the Revenue Committee has gone over this issue. Every time there's a different um, attempt at justifying why this makes sense. And there is no data, there is no analysis that supports, um, let alone the dollar, <laughs> doubling it or tripling it or quintupling it when there is more revenue to be gained as demonstrated in analysis by helping our projects go forward, not to mention the long-term transmission. We have been working so hard to bring to Wyoming. We're trying to do something no one else is doing, develop a new market for a Wyoming resource that's not being used today, develop the pathway to get to that market over federal lands and develop this cost competitive resource. We have so much local government support. I believe you're going to hear some of that today. So I would just ask you, please vote this bill down. Vote, you don't have to like wind. Use it to vote for economic development, for job creation, for opportunity for Wyoming's kids who were just talked about in the Casper Star Tribune, how important it is for their future. Read this most recent issue of REN magazine that went out to all the cooperatives. A guy trained to be a wind turbine technician, he got a job two days after graduation. Vote for economic diversification, support for your energy authority, which our projects align with, and vote for the Wyoming Business Council, who is trying to develop opportunities, not only for new businesses like ours, but ancillary businesses, the construction companies from Gillette, 
the surveying companies from Casper, the oil and gas field services companies who are calling me all the time for wanting work in Wyoming. So please, 15 meetings, we're gonna have another conversation of this again next week at revenue and probably again in December. So I just ask this committee, please vote this bill down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for Ms. Choquette? Seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Choquette, appreciate your testimony. Um, and as a reminder to um, folks, we, I, I know that uh, it is frustrating and this is something that we're all passionate about and you've got a lot to say and a lot to pass on to the committee, but know that there's like 20 other people behind you um, that we're starting to limit their time also. Uh, so please be- Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, go I'm ahead. just, yeah, with, with in, in light of things, um, I, I, I didn't know, do we have a time limit to, because we, we've got not only this, but net metering as well. Yeah. And so I want to be respectful of all the people that came to Cheyenne. Right. And, and, and not that we don't want to hear anybody's testimony, but when people drone on, you begin to lose people as well. And right. so, so we're going to, we're going to set a time limit of three minutes at this point. And I know that's kind of uh, just try to wrap it up and be brief. I know that's rough, but we do want to hear every from everyone in, in, in regards to these topics. All of your voices are important, um, whether you're representing yourself or, or an organization. Um, the next individual we're going to go to is Jennifer Kirkhofer. And I'm, I am certain that I mispronounced that. I am so sorry uh, that uh, I am bad at that. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, um, it's Kurt Schaffer. That's okay. <laughs> so, and um, my testimony is written, so I'll read it. I'll try not to um, go any longer than that. So thank you to all the veterans and for everyone sharing their stories today. Uh, that was great to hear. It was very emotional. Um, Jennifer Kurt Schaffer. I'm a Wyoming representative of the Wildlife, Energy, and Community Coalition, and I live in Albany County at the I-80 Summit. Um, I don't have experience in all the complexities regarding industrial wind taxes for every state. What I do have is experience in being a parent. I have sat in on a few Wyoming committee meetings and I have heard comments from pro-wind individuals <laughs> claiming a repeal of the wind tax exemption would be unfair because no other state has a wind production tax. As a parent, this reminds me of children pleading a case to their parents saying the responsibility of feeding their horses is unfair because none of their friends have to feed their horses every morning. As parents were smart enough to know that in order for little Wendy's argument to sound as unfair as possible, she neglects to reveal that her friends also have responsibilities too, they're just different. We as citizens of Wyoming trust that the members of the Joint Corporations Committee also realize that each state has unique requirements and responsibilities. If Wendy chooses not to accomplish what is required of her, the burden goes for her family to find another way to fulfill those responsibilities. When industrial wind companies receive the benefit of a three-year production tax exemption, the burden is placed on Wyoming to generate that income from another source. Just because Big Wind is unhappy their hiatus from the required responsibilities may end does not mean Wyoming should continue to shoulder the burden of finding other ways to produce that income. The fact that industrial wind companies don't like Wyoming's tax structure and it's unique compared to other states does not equally transfer to, to being unfair. The structure is just different. Every state has a unique set of taxes and fees which apply to industrial wind, the privilege of choosing to do business in Wyoming and industrializing this state with wind turbines comes with a price. It is time Wyoming brings accountability into the equation. There's a price for doing business in Wyoming and big wind should be held accountable for paying that price, not in three years, but from day one. Some things aren't for sale, but when it's regrettably required, our valuable Wyoming land comes at a premium and we fully deserve to be compensated. I'd also like you to reflect on the statewide effects of shuttering Wyoming's coal plants, the countless individuals losing their jobs, and many counties no longer receiving income from this industry. This is a devastating economic blow, but do we really want to put all our eggs in one basket yet again by replacing coal with a different energy industry? An industry which after 30 years still heavily relies on federal tax subsidies and Wyoming's three-year wind tax exemption to survive. This raises a big red flag. Over many decades, the industrial wind industry has definitely evolved, but it remains unreliable and unsustainable. Do we want to set ourselves up for a second wave of economic devastation when reality hits and wind energy is no longer the answer? Is the future plan to decommission all the wind turbines, offer up exemptions to the next latest and greatest? What will our landscape look like after being decimated by these enormous industrial wind projects? How can we calculate the economic losses in tourism 
when forever west is forever ruined. Okay, ma'am, can you wrap up your comments? Um, just yes. Time limit. I, I, I'm so sorry, I apologize, but uh, that's what we're gonna have to do to get through everybody. Yeah, I just wanna say then that they mentioned that Wyoming may not, may not corner the market on wind, but the Office of Tourism invested $4.6 million in 2019 paid advertising generating $1.6 billion in visitor spending to the state because people wanna to come to Wyoming. There are regulations at the county level, oh, sorry, um, but they wanna to come to see our Western character and see Wyoming's wildlife and natural landscapes up close and personal, unobstructed by wind turbines. So I'm asking that you take this into consideration and repeal the three-year wind tax exemption right away. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. It is really appreciated. The next uh, next person we're going to is Maria White. Miss White, are you there? Oh, you're muted still. There we go. All right, go for it, ma'am. We're not hearing you. Are you there, Miss White? No, we can't hear you. Click to join the audio, Mr. Chairman. She needs to click to join the audio. You might have to click to join the audio. We had heard you previously. We did. Oh, we got there, gotcha. Oh, we had you. Oh, no, she's muted. Now you're muted again. Now you're muted again. There, am I good now? Yeah, we got you, I think. Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my name is Mariah White. Um, I don't represent any particular organization. I'm just a citizen of Wyoming. Um, and I am strongly in favor of the repealing of this three-year moratorium on wind. Um, Wyoming woes, uh, woos wind energy companies through its wide open spaces and world-class wind. It does not need this moratorium to make it more appealing. With the current fiscal difficulties facing the state as coal is phased out, the state should make every effort to collect from any source possible. This moratorium has already potentially cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars, which needs to stop now. Other states that might have a lower tax on renewable energies probably have a wider variety of sources of income. Without the moratorium, Wyoming is still extremely competitive. For example, Iowa and Minnesota have higher rates at $1.20 per megawatt with no moratorium. Are wind projects still going into Minnesota and Iowa? Absolutely. One of the problems that I have with this moratorium is that it has become a gateway to wind energy companies indirectly requesting further tax relief. Boswell Springs and Roundhouse wind projects have both requested extensions of construction, which will further the date when this excise tax is actually paid. This makes me nervous about the long-term viability of wind projects. The obvious solution is to have the tax be the same all the time. It is clear, straightforward, and part of the cost of doing business in Wyoming. I would love to address the facade of job creation from the wind industry. There is an average of one permanent job per 1,300 acres used. To give perspective to this, if all of Wyoming's 63 million acres were covered in wind turbines, there would be only 49,000 jobs in the entire state. Wyoming needs every dollar and industries that provide a higher rate of tax creation, of job creation, like tourism. Tourism does not thrive in areas with turbines and nothing says welcome to Wyoming like thousands of turbines. As a side note, once this land is used, it cannot be used for anything other than grazing. It will not generate more prosperity in the form of residential or commercial developments. For every 300 square miles of land used for turbines, the state accrues over 20 million in opportunity cost and property value tax loss. I have the documentation to support these statements if you would like me to give it to you. In conclusion, this moratorium sells Wyoming short. 
Thank you. That was a perfect timing, right at three minutes. Way to, way to smack it out of the park. Uh, any questions for Ms. White? Committee? That was powerful. Seeing none, thank you very much, ma'am. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, next, we're gonna be going to Mr. Chris Brown. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chris Brown representing Powering Up Wyoming this morning. We stand opposed to the continued proposals increasing the taxes on wind energy in Wyoming. Um, Mr. Chairman, from our perspective, more tax on wind is not going to equate to significant revenue growth for the state. We've heard a lot today about the need for Wyoming to remain competitive. And Ms. Cho Kett already referenced the study that Dr. Godby at the university did that shows that Wyoming is already less competitive than a number of the states we compete with. But the discussion today really is about Wyoming being in a difficult fiscal position and the need to diversify our state's revenue picture. Mr. Chairman, wind energy is well poised to play a really important role in diversifying and adding additional revenue and jobs to the state's overall economic picture. Currently, there is nearly $10 billion in projected wind projects for Wyoming. And it's our perspective, Mr. Chairman, that a competitive business environment will result in many of these increased investments being made increasing the tax revenues being realized by both the state and local governments and increasing job opportunities in area where development does occur. And the year over year sales tax increases in carbon and converse counties this, this year are a really good example of the diversification and benefit that are being realized and that can be built upon if we can just remain competitive. More taxes, more uncertainty could result in many of these projected investments to be realized in other states. Um, and so it's our position, Mr. Chairman, that the wind industry is ready to play an important role in the solution for Wyoming if we can remain competitive. Mr. Chairman, I realize there's a lot of folks um, lined up to speak today and many of my points have already been covered. So I appreciate the committee's time today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Brown. Representative Clem, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not, not really a, a question. I appreciate the, the brief statement. I was just reflecting on something with the previous speaker, though, and, you know, she mentioned that she was just a Wyoming citizen. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's the most important voice that we've heard. Uh, the rest, I mean, not to discount industry folks and lobbyists, but when we hear from actual citizens on the matter, I think that, that that's, that's top priority in my book. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And while I certainly um, sometimes don't agree with citizens, I certainly don't mess with citizens either. Um, <laughs> whereas I've been known, known to tangle with an with a, a, a industry representative from time to time. Mr. Brown, really appreciate your testimony, sir. And thank you for uh, staying tough with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to be going to Nathan uh, Blown, or Bloom. I am certain I mispronounced that. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, that's that's all right, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, it's blue in, blue in. Pardon me. Go ahead, sir. Both different uh, different takes on that one. So, uh, it's not not you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry. Um, as a reminder, you, um, um, we've got that three minute time limit. And committee, if at any time you need to uh, um, take a break or something like that, go ahead and go. Um, I'm not going to call an official break because I'm ordering or through. And yeah, we're going to power through. Uh, but if you need to step away for a minute, please feel free to do so. As long as we maintain quorum, we're fine. Uh, Mr. Blumen, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, and, and uh, to members of the committee, thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Nate Bluen. I'm the policy manager for the Interwest Energy Alliance, and uh, I'm happy to be back in front of this committee today on behalf of uh, the utility-scale renewable energy industry to speak uh, in opposition to the proposal to end the three-year grace period on uh, Wyoming's wind generation tax. Um, wind, uh, wind development is a, a capital intensive industry. The, the vast majority of that capital is spent at the beginning of a project's lifespan. Uh, this is the opposite of a coal or natural gas plant, which incurs significant fuel costs throughout their lifespan. Uh, when Wyoming's generation tax was implemented with a three year grace period, it was done so largely to defray uh, capital costs during the construction phase. 
Even with the grace period, uh, wind development in Wyoming stalled after the tax was levied in 2010. Uh, and it's really only picked up in the past couple of years um, as we kind of heard from, from John Cox earlier to take advantage of the expiring federal production tax credit uh, in, in concert with some of those transmission projects. Uh, so while the PTC dampened the impact of Wyoming's wind uh, tax, the PTC is phasing out this year uh, and uh, it, it will increase the relative effect uh, of the generation tax on the production, uh, which would be particularly acute if the three-year grace period is phased out at the same time. Uh, in, an in, in, in an industry where uh, bids are won and lost on margins of uh, just a couple of cents per megawatt hour of energy production, uh, Wyoming is sending a signal that project developers should look elsewhere. Recent RFPs from Black Hills Energy and Excel and, and also the one that was discussed earlier uh, from uh, Pacific Corp uh, in neighboring states have drawn hundreds of bids to build renewable energy projects. These bids have been low cost in the range of $18 a megawatt hour for wind uh, and they've been incredibly competitive. Excel's 2018 RFP had dozens of bids to build wind projects uh, and saw a spread from the highest to the lowest bid of under $1 per megawatt hour. Uh, this means that there were mere cents separating one bid from another, uh, which is much less than Wyoming's existing generation tax. And such a small that the uh, repeal of the, the grace period would almost certainly add an amount to costs that would cause a project to slip down the list and uh, probably not get built. Uh, so that's uh, all I'd like to say today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be in front of the, the committee and uh, happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you very much, sir. Any questions for Mr. Blood? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, next we're going to go to Mr. Paul Montoya. Mr. Montoya, are you available? There you are. I am available. Let's see. Let me click the start by video. Thank you all. And I appreciate you to recognize the Veterans Day today. If you'll indulge me, I'll stay within my time limit, but I have to recognize my father. Benny Montoya, who served in France in World War II. Uh, like Representative Furphy, my father was also involved in uh, electronics as a tech sergeant and uh, later gave him a career in electronics at Sandia Laboratory, so that was pretty cool. Uh, I also have to remember my uncle Eddie Baca, Edward Baca, who uh, passed away this year. Uh, he was a lifelong uh, military person in the National Guard. He actually became a United States Army Lieutenant General who was uh, the first Hispanic to serve as chief of the National, National Guard Bureau in Washington, D.C. in the mid-90s. And uh, he passed away. I was able to attend his funeral. And it was amazing because it's the first military funeral I've been to that actually uh, brought his casket in on a horse-drawn caisson. And they had an F-16 flyover. So it was pretty neat, very special. So thank you for remembering the veterans today. Um, my name is Paul Montoya. I'm not a lobbyist. I live in Albany County. Um, I testify today in support of the proposed wind tax exemption repeal uh, file number 182. Uh, it's at a time where the, our state's got to watch money that it doesn't have. Uh, repealing the uh, state statute would indeed gain the state revenue that's needed. The original goal of the tax exemption, I'm sure, was to give incentive for a very young wind energy development industry in Wyoming. And I feel like it's served its purpose already, and now it's time to have it repealed. Uh, this industry is already, as many have mentioned, is heavily uh, federally uh, subsidized, and Wyoming's tax exemption really is no longer needed. Uh, where I realize it's really not part of the proposed bill, bill, I would also recommend an increase to the wind energy tax from $1 per megawatt hour to $2 per megawatt hour, as I feel it's more in keeping with other active wind energy states. Uh, like many states, though, right now, I feel Wyoming really needs to rethink the support of, the industri of industrial wind. As mentioned by many of you legislatures and those that live close to some of the more recently constructed uh, turbine facilities, uh, we're really starting to see the impact in our state of industrial wind on the vistas of our state. And we really have to consider this. Whereas I know a lot of the um, uh, people supporting uh, business within the state are thinking about the jobs from these wind energy uh, facilities, I think we also have to recognize the impact on tourism 
That's our second largest revenue generator in the state. Maybe we really need to consider a focus more on solar and small scale nuclear that don't have this same impact. Um, that's really all of my testimony on this. I would like to reserve some time later to testify also on the uh, customer generated electric systems and net metering uh, systems too. So if you can keep me in the queue for that, it'd be appreciated. I'd be happy to answer any questions from any representatives that you might have just as a, a resident in Wyoming. Any questions for Mr. Montoya? I'm not seeing any and uh, Mr. Montoya, as a fellow audiophile, I appreciate some of the equipment you've got sitting behind you. <laughs> yeah, it's my home studio. This is where I do my show. <laughs> yeah. oh, it looks great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Montoya. I appreciate your testimony very much. Um, we're going to go on now, and I, I will remind those in the waiting room, um, such as Lacey O and um, some of the other folks that have, are represented by numbers or something else, if you were um, planning on testifying, I cannot recognize who you are because uh, I don't have that. Um, I don't have that on there. Or you can email our LSO, uh, Katie Talbot, to let them know your, what, your, what your name is associated with in the queue, and that would help me tremendously. Uh, we're going to go now to Amy Bach, uh, Ms. Bach with um, uh, the city of Rollins. Ms. Bach, are you available? Ms. Bach, are you there? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, for the sake of government economy and efficiency, we also have President Yvonne Johnson from the Carbon County Economic Development Corp. She will not present any statements today, as well as Commissioner Trav Dr. Travis Moore is here to present on behalf of the Carbon County Commissioners in COG. He has submitted the required notification to okay. this committee. First and foremost, I would like to extend the city's sincere appreciation to this committee for providing this opportunity to speak today. As many of you know, Carbon County has not been uh, uh, viewed as potential primary sites for many manufacturing, industrial, or technological sites. Additionally, we are not set up or uh, set for well positioned to attract and recruit new businesses based upon uh, shovel ready properties or lack of shovel ready properties, as well as our environmental controls. Our conditions. Projects such as the Wyoming Power Company of Wyoming, Choke Cherry Sierra Madre Wind Farm continue to provide a predictable revenue stream that will not only bring revenue, but more importantly, help stabilize our economy and thereby permit our, our county to develop and create financial plans that will encourage and create opportunities for steady growth and truly help diversify our economy. Furthermore, it would help the Carbon County provide stable and reliable contributions to the state's generals fund, which would benefit every citizen in the state of Wyoming. What I can share with you um, in this committee is that 12 years ago, uh, the red carpet was not rolled out for Power Company of Wyoming. In fact, they faced a number of critical and challenging issues regarding bonding and decommissioning and ensuring that the most sacred of our view sheds uh, were going to be protected and continue to provide that tourism uh, component for not only visitors, but for us that choose to call this place home. What I can tell you is that it's been 12 long years uh, of uncertainty and um, continuous uh, requests for the city of Rollins, Carbon County and other wind development uh, counties uh, to present and uh, represent uh, the reasons for the stability that's needed and necessary for a developer. 12 years into a project is a little difficult to now try and account for additional uh, costs to the project as a whole that cannot be passed on to the rate user. They must be competitive. Uh, they're dealing with other businesses that are, are in a competitive market. And additionally, $1 to a rate uh, regulated uh, Wyoming State Utility Company would simply pass those on to their rate users. In this instance, uh, they're, being, um, they're facing challenges across the state. 
simply put, uh, these projects are the lifeblood of Carbon County and may help provide much needed revenue to the state of Wyoming. While those with more skilled minds can develop new revenue and new avenues and markets for our beloved coal, oil, and gas. Our history is rich in making, uh, being open to what's beyond the horizon and being prepared for what comes next, all the while celebrating and remembering and being incredibly proud of our heritage as the energy state. We continue to believe that responsible wind energy development that adheres to local and state restrict restrictions should be part of what's next for our state. And we welcome that diversification to our energy portfolio, which we hope will ensure our continued position as being the energy state. Uh, I would stand for questions. And then again, I have uh, Commissioner Dr. Moore here as well. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Bach with the city of Rollins? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Bach. Uh, we're now going, going to go to Commissioner Moore, Commissioner Travis Moore, I believe. They almost have to crouch down. The camera's not set up for taller people. Yeah, I, 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 I tell you, I'm six foot seven myself, and it's not handy at times. Go. go ahead, Commissioner. In, 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 in terms of introduction, my name is Dr. Moore. I serve on the Carbon County Commission and was chosen as a delegate to speak to this committee on behalf of the Carbon County Council of Governments which represents Carbon County and all 10 of her municipalities. Our concerns, uh, moreover, for this, I am not an economist. I'm not uh, an expert uh, in electric generation or any of those things, but I do know these things. The wind energy corporations in Carbon County have been good neighbors to our ranchers, to our recreators, and we've heard those testimonials through our conditional use permit applications with these companies from those ranchers and recreators. Uh, we've worked hand, hand in hand with them through industrial siting. They have been good partners to us. And in opposition to this legislation today, I just want to offer this consideration. Um, this will impact the people of Carbon County who are starting to see a little bit of vibrancy in these dark times for generations. So we would like to not have any interference with the development that's taking place for Choke Cherry Sierra Madre. And we really value their participation here in Carbon County and want to welcome them as long-term neighbors um, as Rocky Mountain Power and their projects have been also. But we would like to see that uh, here. That is the will of the Carbon County Council of Governments. And I can't speak for all commissioners on this issue, that that sentiment has been made known by the citizens of Carbon County through their testimony at these hearings that we have had issuing these permits. I thank you for your time. And another shout out to the veterans uh, serving now. And in previous times, I am an educator by trade. So those are my students and other people that are out serving all over the world. God bless America. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner. Any questions for Commissioner Moore? Seeing none. Thank you very much, sir. All right, on our list, um, I'm gonna, the next one I've got listed on my list is Mr. Brett Wadsworth. Mr. Wadsworth, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can, we can hear and see you. Please uh, go ahead. Very well, I will be brief. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, my name is Brett Wadsworth. I live at 25 Staghorn Road near Laramie up at the uh, I-80 Summit. Uh, I'm not an expert in the related fields, uh, and, uh, but I am a concerned citizen and resident here. Wyoming clearly has a budget problem. And yes, to help that problem, we need to diversify the tax base. I support that, but diversifying the tax base should be done in a way to spread the pain as well as the benefits as widely as possible, in my opinion. In circumstances where the main negative impacts are carried primarily by those who live nearby a project and in the uh, rural areas, as mentioned by Cindy Delaney er earlier, I object to that disproportionate uh, balancing of rewards and penalties, so to speak. Also, we should not negatively impact uh, other revenue generating uh, industries, tourism, for instance, and development of new met revenue streams. We've got to maintain a long view of all the related issues. Yes, we wish to avoid creating an adverse wind energy development climate in Wyoming. 
but we are a very pro-energy state and a place with 50% of the best class six and class seven winds in the continental United States. So we certainly have that going for us regardless of what else is out there. With the federal tax incentives that currently remain in place and with the likely Biden administration and possibly further uh, extension of those types of things in the future and the growing demand for clean energy that is forecast for decades to come, I'm optimistic that Wyoming will remain a key location for future wind development even if the state wind tax exemption is repealed. The number is provided by Mrs. Choquette. Again, I apologize if I massacred her name. On the relative costs between regional states were a valuable piece of information. For final decisions, I would ask that these numbers be used along with considerations of how the costs of these projects are borne by all citizens and by other industries and the pristine environment of Wyoming. I support a very close look at repealing the wind tax exemption, doing an extensive cost benefit analysis with qualitative data and being careful about placing the majority of related costs on the rural residents exclusively, as well as potentially damaging other industries and the culture of Wyoming. It's not just about our budget problem right now, although that's the closest alligator to the boat, to, to the boat excuse me, but it's also about Wyoming for decades to come. I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to provide comment. Any questions for Mr. Wadsworth? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, going next on the list is Sean McCarvel. And um, while Sean's getting ready, um, I'm gonna note to the waiting room, whoever 006287 is, I don't know who you are. Um, and if you're scheduled to testify on this piece of legislation, um, if you could let uh, LSO staff know who you are, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCarl, go, go ahead, please. Good morning. And again, uh, thank you to all the veterans. I speak uh, briefly on behalf of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers for the state of Wyoming and would ask uh, that this we stand opposed to this, and in particular, just to keep my comments brief and not uh, be repetitive, job opportunities are what the citizens of Wyoming as electrical workers need. And uh, as you, we've all heard about the, from the developers and the utility market, uh, compromising that would, in essence, compromise opportunities within the state of Wyoming for its residents that work in that capacity. Thank you again. Mr. McCarville, which local um, union are you representing? So I, I'm a service representative for IBW locals 322, 415, and 612 in the state of Wyoming. 612? I used to be a member of 612 back in the day. All right. Thank you. You know what 612 does, right? Mr. Yes. McCarville? Yes. Yeah, we, were, we were going to coal-fired power plant. <laughs> 100%. And 415 also represents employees for Basin Electric out of a coal-fired power plant. Right, drive for it. Yes. All right, any questions for Mr. McCarville? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarville. I appreciate your time. Thank you all. All right, next up, we're going to Clayton. I'm going to mispronounce your last name, Clayton. I'm so sorry, Mike. Or, uh, yeah. Yep, we see you. We cannot hear you, though. You're still muted, sir. There you go. It's Clayton Mix, sir. Mix. Sorry. I apologize. Ah, it's been that way my whole life. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the community, thank you so much for hearing my comment today. My name is Clayton Mick. I'm with Hall Trucking in, here in Casper, Wyoming. I would like to start state that uh, Hall Trucking is opposed to the proposed tax on the increase on wind because attracting new business and wind development helps our business here in Wyoming. Um, I'm gonna keep my comments extremely brief. We have purchased a, a multi-million dollar 800 ton crane in anticipation and all its support vehicles and equipment to go with it in anticipation of wind energy coming to Wyoming. Um, and if Wyoming becomes uncompetitive for wind development, it would most definitely hurt our business here in Casper. And uh, just don't want to be repetitive. Take my time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mix. Senator Nethercott, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mick, thank you for being here. 
Uh, I understand that you're in Casper and, and you have a trucking company like you just identified. Did you used to, uh, or, or still perhaps supply resources for the oil industry and you're trying to pivot now to wind? Is that your business model? Yes, ma'am. We start in oil and gas industry and in in specializing in heavy hauling and rig moving. And we started to transition into wind here uh, about a year and a half ago because it's it's an upcoming project everywhere. I mean, it's it's a great industry to keep our employees working and expanding our business. Follow up, Senator Nelica. Okay, Representative Claussen, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meek, do you find that, that, that uh, most of the wind companies are, are uh, using local contractors or do you find that they bring in very large uh, out-of-state uh, contractors that basically handle all of the work and uh, don't sub out much. What's, your, what's been your experience? Because I've kind of had a had a lot of complaints from my local contractor, Mr. Mick. Well, they they do they use both. They use us local. Right. Um, we have local companies here, TPNL, GSS, uh, other crane service providers here, and they use local cranes. They use local trucking throughout the nation. Uh, if they if they if they have the equipment available, um, a lot of this is a lot of specialized equipment that we have to spend a lot of money on getting to haul these large loads, these super loads throughout Wyoming and the country. But no, they do they do use local if the, the resources are available in equipment. Follow up, Representative Clausen. No follow up. Any other questions for Mr. Mick? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. All right, next on my list, I've got uh, Ms. Lisa Lanos. I'm probably mispronouncing that also. One of these days I'm gonna get better at this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, you did very well on my last name. Uh, right. It's Lanos. I had a, a question before I start. I do have slides attached to my written testimony. Which I, I was wondering if you guys have those slides, so it will change the way I present. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, those slides were forwarded by Ms. Talbot. Yeah. We don't necessarily have a way to show them at the same time, but we could refer to them, I suppose. Yeah. Find yep. the email from Ms. Talbot. We do have oh. uh, the committee members do have your slides, so you can just refer to um, refer to your. Um, your slides, but you can also screen share if you'd like to do that. Oh, unfortunately, I do. Uh, actually, I might be. I, I'll, I'll talk through it. Um, it's, okay. I don't want to take time with the technology right now. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Lisa Linos. I am uh, a resident of the state of New Hampshire, executive director of the Wind Action Group, which is a or national organization that tracks wind energy development and the policies that incentivize development. I'm here to speak in support of the repeal of the three-year exemption period. Um, and, I'm, and the reason I'm, you'll understand why in a, a moment. Um, under current U.S. tax law and IRS regulations, wind projects that start, started construction before the end of 2016 and are placed in service before the end of 2021 will receive a tax credit, the production tax credit, valued at $25 a megawatt hour if for every megawatt hour generated for the first 10 years of operation. That uh, is a significant amount of money. Uh, and that's, if you do have slide the first slide, that equates to for a one megawatt, out, for one megawatt project installed, that equates to just shy of a million dollars over the 10 year period that a one megawatt project would receive in production tax credits. The bottom line is the public is covering, based on current costs of building a project, roughly 68% of the capital cost of that project being built. There's a significant amount of money that the public, the taxpayers at large, are covering for the price of a project being built. I'd like to put to rest the idea that the industry, though, is a, an emergency, emerging industry. It is not. The production tax credit was put in place in 1992. It has had incremental cost of living increases over time. That's why it now sits at $25 a megawatt hour. 
um, and there are more megawatts of wind operating in the United States than there is nuclear power. So it's a very significant subsidy. What I looked at, and if you look at slide two, um, if you have it, I looked at the cost uh, of, the, of the wind tax, the Wyoming wind tax on projects. So one megawatt uh, project that is constructed in the state of Wyoming that has a three-year exemption, I'm assuming a, a life of 20 years on a turbine. Well, I know that we're told that they can survive up to 30 years and better, but we really don't know that with certainty because most of the wind operating today has been operating for less than 20 years. Um, so I, I use using a 20 year life on a turbine and 17 years of taxation under the wind tax. That project is paying, that one megawatt project is paying about $67,014 in taxes to the state of Wyoming. That's, relative, that's compared, comparing that to the million dollars, roughly, that they're getting in production tax credit. If you were to remove the three-year exemption, that tax is $78,840, one megawatt. Ms. Lewis, that, wrap up, please. I'm sorry? Can you wrap up, oh, please? I just certainly. Thank you. I just, I just if I could... Um, <laughs> Okay, then, um, and I'm sorry, I did there are a couple, two other points I wanted to make that are very important. Slide three, uh, the slide three shows that you currently have a pipeline of projects that are ready, to, that are permitted and can be built of roughly 6,000 megawatts. This puts to rest the idea that the wind industry has stopped building in Wyoming. There's plenty of wind that is proposed to be built. In the fourth slide, you could see that there's 1,816 megawatts of operating wind in Wyoming. If you can compare that to the other states and the megawatts that are installed, there is, uh, you're, you're on par with the other states. It's not like there was a reduction in wind because of the tax. It was any slowness was likely due to the lack of transmission. But if I can make this one point, since 2013, 65% or better of the megawatts built in the United States were built in four states, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. It's not like they weren't building wind and it's not like they were ignoring Wyoming. They were focusing on other states. So, and then finally, my last slide, I would highly recommend in the case of fairness, that you considering consider applying instead of a flat one dollar tax, that you use the model of the severance tax that you have on natural gas, and that would raise the price to a dollar eighty on a, a wind tax, assuming a thirty dollar a megawatt hour electricity price. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Linoz. Any questions for Ms. Linoz? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Good job. New Hampshire, live free or die state. <laughs> you didn't vote that way in the last talk. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us did. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yeah, oh, Representative uh, um, Clem, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just looking at the slide here. And the last point that you made here, I'm looking at that last one, the natural gas versus wind, the 6% severance. Are you suggesting that that 6% be added in place of the, the $1 per megawatt, the one, yeah, $1 per megawatt hour? Is that what you're suggesting? Exactly. I'm saying that, uh, correct. In oh. order to be fair, let's use a, the same policy. Got it. Thank you. Follow up, Representative Clausen. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my question is on the federal subsidy. So how would this go about? Is it, it's a tax subsidy from profit somewhere else that goes into the investment? Is that, am I on the right track or could you just give me a quick overview of the federal subsidy and how it would work? Ms. How that work? Oh, sure. You want to know how it works? Effect, the effective the effect of the production tax credit is to reduce the capital cost. So uh, what happens is that those tax credits are pre-sold to an investor who is, when the project goes online, he's able to now, that investor who has a large tax burden is looking to offset his capital costs by um, using those tax credits as they're generated over the course of 10 years. And so we're, that, that's how that money comes into play. It's not it, per se a direct dollar for dollar handed to the wind company every time he puts energy on the grid but it has the effect of dramatically reducing the cost of the capital, that, you, that the amount of capital that's used to build the project. 
the difference being between the 68% and 100% is made up with equity from the developer as well as con uh, traditional construction loans. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no further follow-up questions, appreciate your testimony, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, next we're gonna be going to Mr. David Bush. Dave, are you there? There you are. You gotta unmute, it's technology. This is 2020, Dave. All right, how's that? Perfect. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I will be as brief as possible. I, I do uh, also want to join us with many others in thanking our veterans, especially uh, my father-in-law, Jack Waltz, um, served in the Army. He flew Hueys in Vietnam, um, so he was in a particularly dangerous field there, but uh, just want to thank them all and, and for their service and certainly uh, appreciated the comments this morning from the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman and others, um, I'm here, David Bush, Black Hills Energy, I forgot to do that. Um, we are opposed to this legislation. Uh, we have a project west of town, some of you may have heard of uh, from this area, it's called Corydale. It's on the, uh, the King Ranch property, it's approximately 52 uh, megawatts. Uh, it's a subscription-based service that we're doing for large industrial and commercial businesses and government as well. So. Um, we had several uh, companies, many of whom you would know their names here in Cheyenne, uh, tech companies and, and uh, 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 data centers, things like that, that were interested in having wind power. They have corporate uh, goals that they're looking to achieve when it comes to renewables, and uh, we thought we could help them achieve that through building our uh, wind project and serving their needs that way. So. Um, the prices uh, certainly would be a factor if taxes go up, we would have to go back to those folks and uh, uh, look at that as a possibility to raise those rates. And uh, as the committee, this committee and others and the legislature in general has uh, talked about over the past couple of years, electricity prices are something that the legislature is concerned about and uh, increasing those prices with increasing taxes uh, just doesn't seem to be the best idea at this point. So um, with that, um, like I said, I'll try to be brief. I know there's a lot of other people still to come and, and a lot of others before me. So um, I think that's it for now, Mr. Chairman. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, um, Senator Case, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Bush, I'm intrigued by your subscription service for renewable energy. And I would just venture to guess that these uh, companies that wish to subscribe to your renewable offering, they care about this planet and they, they're they willing to uh, possibly even pay more for renewable resources so that they can uh, you know, be a better citizen of this planet and also use it. I think it's not unhelpful to market yourself as being a green focused company would you agree, Mr. Bush? Is that part of their motivation? Go ahead, Mr. Bush. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, uh, I think that is a, a, uh, an appropriate uh, way to look at this. They are setting corporate goals um, at the, their headquarters levels uh, to be more green and, and use more renewable energy. Um, you know, for our part, we're looking at uh, how can we continue to serve them and be a partner in economic development for the state and for the city of Cheyenne where we have uh, our primary electric service. So um, it, is, it is a piece of it, whether or not they would wanna pay higher prices. Um, I wasn't involved in the, uh, the sales pitches per se for the uh, Renewable Ready program, uh, but I'm guessing that they, there's a certain point where they wouldn't wanna pay more and they would probably look at perhaps building their own uh, generation, which for the most part is more expensive for them, but um, you know, that there's, there's other options out there. So um, that's certainly a valid point though, Mr. Chairman and Senator Case. May I follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Well, my only follow up would be if these, if these companies care about their impact on the planet, um, care about being uh, renewable, don't you think they might care about Wyoming too? And the consequences of placing 
use, using vast amounts of our landscapes to, sa to satisfy their uh, marketing desires to promote themselves as being green. It's kind of fair, I think, and, and I think it connects also with our good friends in Oregon and Washington and California, who also have make, made decisions to purchase more green energy. They, they do it for the right reasons about the planet, but we're part of the planet here in Wyoming, and I hope that we can prevail on them, that it might be appropriate to pay a little bit more to the people of Wyoming for the loss of something that we'll never see again, which is our wonderful landscapes. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. And if you don't want to comment on it, that's okay too. But um, it seems like that if they do, are doing this for good reasons, they're good corporate citizens. We have another good reason to add to that, to help them be even better corporate citizens and friends to the state of Wyoming. Mr. Bush, do you feel this is an alley-oop from the legislature and helping you become a good corporate citizen? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, uh, that is, um, those are all uh, probably valid points, I think, um, that uh, Senator Case has brought up. Any other questions for uh, Mr. David Bush? Seeing none, good seeing you, Dave. And uh, I did get to meet you, your father-in-law the other night. I didn't know he was a veteran also. Tell him thank you for yes, sir. All right, thank next, you. next up we've got Mr. Jeff McDonald. Jeff, are you there? Can you hear us? See him in the room. Just asked to unmute him. Mr. Jeff McDonald. He must have stepped away. We'll come back to Jeff McDonald. Um, next up we have uh, Commissioner Malm, Gunner Malm. Are you there, Gunner? There he is. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much and committee. Uh, first, thank you, Chairman Lindholm, for your service and Representative Blackburn uh, to the country. And then thank you, uh, Representative Lindholm, for your service to the state. I, uh, for one, will miss your voice of liberty in the uh, legislature, but I'm sure we'll see you again. So thank you. First, I'm here, I'm Laramie County Commissioner Gunnar Malm, uh, and to Representative Klim's earlier point, I'm a citizen who was elected by um, other citizens to represent 100,000 people. So to that end, I am against uh, this bill and this repeal, uh, mainly because I've seen the benefits and the revenues that have come to Laramie County from wind already. Uh, we just got our sales tax receipts uh, that directly relate to the Next Era project. And they um, added $2 million to our coffers that help pay for many of the unfunded mandates that the legislature has handed down to counties, including public health, criminal justice, courts, Title 25, indigent burials, the Parents Council, and the County Extension Office, just to name a few. Um, so these funds that are already coming in to local governments uh, greatly help us in a time where uh, the state legislature will obviously have more cuts coming uh, to programs like treatment courts and the Department of Health. Uh, I also am opposed to this because I see it as a short-term uh, kind of, it's, it's looking at the short-term instead of a long-term plan for Wyoming and what it has to offer in terms of economic diversification. The industries that are brought into Wyoming uh, that want to capitalize upon uh, green or renewable energy uh, are really yet to be tapped, except for here in Laramie County, where the beneficiary of our largest taxpayer being Microsoft, a tech company that no doubt uh, would greatly benefit or business model would uh, rely heavily upon green energy given its um, kind of base of operations. Um, I think that in the long term, uh, continued support of wind and renewable energy will allow Wyoming to continue to be a energy exporter to the United States, but it'll also help us prevent uh, continuing to be a talent exporter. Uh, when we get these other industries coming in, it 
keeps our graduates and our citizens here in Wyoming at that $16,000 per pupil. It allows us to see a return on that investment when we are able to keep more of those people here in Wyoming. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you might questions have. Questions for Commissioner Mom. Seeing none, really appreciate your time, Commissioner. Thanks for joining us. And uh, um, yeah, next time come on down, we're down at the Capitol. We're socially distanced down here though. We even got plexiglass in front of our, we're being safe. Definitely. Too. And we got face masks too. We're fancy guys. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I, I just saw the uh, general counsel for the Division of Banking just step into the room. Um, would you like to testify? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wouldn't know that Albert's here too. <laughs> I didn't recognize him. Oh, we've got the director of uh, the Division of Banking here. Would you like to testify, sir? No? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's that? So it looks like casual Wednesday. So it does look like casual Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're off the clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll quit picking on you. All right, um, I'm going to give Jeff McDonald a chance to poke his head up again. Um, Mr. McDonald, are you are you available this time? Oh, I think we got him now. All right, Mr. McDonald, welcome to uh, the Corporations Committee meeting. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief. I did submit testimony to all the legislatures via email and LSO. I'll just hit a, a couple points. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition of the wind tax exemption repeal. Um, off at all construction is very fortunate to have picked up construction work associated with Pacific Corp Energy's vision 2020 in Southern Wyoming. I'd just like to share off at all's peak employee count in Wyoming this year in 2020. Coal zero. Uranium zero, railroad zero, oil and gas zero, coal fired power plants, four people, wind and transmission, 86 employees, our Casper shopping office, 33. Our peak count for the year was 147. So you can see how much that 86 jobs meant to off the all construction. Um, because of this work in Southern Wyoming, we've been able to keep all of our people employed in Casper, and there's a good paying jobs, you know, to support the work in the field. And we also spend a lot of money in Detrona County. I mean, just between um, Wyoming Machinery, Hunt and Equipment, Mobile Concrete, and McMurray Ready Mix, we spent over $6 million this year with those vendors. In Sweetwater County, we spent $2.3 million with Lewis and Lewis. And there's a great multiplier effect to these large projects. I'm not gonna go over the statistics that everybody's already talking about, but we need jobs, we need economic development. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for um, Jeff McDonald? Uh, yeah, Senator Schuler, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a, not necessarily a question, just a comment. Um, I really appreciate the data that Mr. McDonald sent ahead of time. Uh, it was pretty uh, eye-opening to me, and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. It, it, um, it that definitely was impactful to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. McDonald? I'm not seeing any. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And uh, we're gonna keep moving here, folks. Um, I would like to note that uh, we are missing several um, several folks that had signed up to testify because I don't recognize what their name is or they're not in the waiting room. Uh, and that's Loretta Anison, Kirk Stone, Ed Ernst, James Lee, and Steffler, Steph Kessler, and Christopher Rumpel. So if you're in the waiting room and you just heard that, or if you're in this room and you just heard that, um, it's because I don't know who you are. You've got a different name. Uh, for example, 006287, uh, if you could change your name, that would be great. Um, so that way I can recognize you at the proper time. We are now gonna go on to Ann Brand. Ann Brand, if you'd like to testify. At least I know that what I sent went through. Mr. Chairman and committee, I'm speaking to you today as a fourth generation one business woman. I own and operate photography, which is the 
for 115 years. New renewable energy push never before experienced in our nation is running at a loss. Miss Brand, you're you're cutting in and out quite a bit. If you could uh, move closer to the microphone or. <coughs> Ms. Brand, are you still there? I am. Can you hear me better? Okay. Okay, go ahead. New okay. The new renewable energy push never before experienced in our nation is running amok. Wyoming needs to take advantage of this climate and eliminate the three-year tax exemption. I'm in support of the wind tax repeal. Renewable energy companies, good and bad, are clamoring to develop in our state. And I'd like to address the comments made by, Ch by Kara Pequet. Um, county regulations and state regulations are out of date and they haven't been updated, taking some of the proposed projects, um, new development in consideration. My county in the southeastern corner it's looking at putting maritime towers directly across from Kurt Gowdy State Park, which the state of Wyoming, the um, park system has announced is one of the two most visited state parks in Wyoming currently. That means more people have come to Kurt Gowdy than the Tetons. I've also um, read data that says that Medicine Bow National Park has more visitors than any other um, national park area. I, I'm talking to you because I read a book years ago when I was in Leadership Wyoming, as did my husband, called Pushed Off the Mountain, Sold Down the River. And that book's by Samuel Western. It's a real quick read. You can read it. And it, it talks about, um, it's a history, it's Wyoming's myth and its economic reality. And I'd like you to seriously consider that. I I admire this committee and just sitting in on two meetings to voice my concerns. I'm tired of companies and paid lobbyists using takeaway sales and barnstorming and making me feel like the intellect of the people of Wyoming is not great enough to deal with this issue. I'm concerned. We need to break the cycle of raping and pillaging of Wyoming for out of state profiteers. We need to have a larger and longer term vision. We need to put Wyoming first, generate income for Wyoming and slow down the onslaught of renewable energy projects and select the good ones. This action will allow us to encourage good development that benefits Wyoming. Renewable installations have environmental impacts that are irreversible and when you're talking about altering a $2 billion industry to Wyoming, that is a concern to me. My business will be dramatically affected by this wind, industrial wind site. I will not succeed as a business owner. My husband who has a tech business that's 25 years in Wyoming, he sat on Governor Meade's technology task force. His, he finds that he's concerned he won't be able to recruit quality talent to our corner of Wyoming because they'll look at this visual blight. I want to make sure if I'm going to approve renewable installations that they good regulations, and my county currently is behind on that. Yes, if shuts and fragile and arid ecotourism, we need to consider this. Let's make money and let's do it the right way so that my children and their children enjoy the Wyoming that I grew up to enjoy. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Brand. Any questions for Ms. Brand? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your testimony. Okay, um, we're gonna go on now to um, Tom Darren. Tom Darren, are you there? Yeah, I can you hear me? I'm trying to start up my video. I think I, I think I see it now. Yep, you're good to go. Thank you. Good morning, or uh, and chairman. Thank you, and members of the committee. Again, my name is Tom Darren, and I'm Western State Affairs Director for the American Wind Energy Association. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Uh, Co chair Lindholm, I've taken your admonition to heart. I've tailored my uh, testimony down just to four points, given what others have said in timing. Number one, 
the wind industry really appreciates your recognitions of Veterans Day today. And it was quite moving, that hour of opening. And I didn't have this plan, but my dad was is a US veteran, fought in World War II in the United States Navy. And if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna move my laptop and I'm not doing a very good job. Yeah, no way to go. There's dad on the wall. I didn't plan that. Uh, but proud of him. I want to mention our industry is point number one on this Veterans Day. Um, veterans possess the exact leadership, technical training, and hard work ethic skills that are very desirable in our industry. We hire vets in the U.S. wind industry at over 60% of a higher rate compared to all other industries in the United States. In fact, that has led to 10% of our U.S. wind technicians and manufacturers and U.S. manufacturing facilities for wind who are U.S. vets. That's over 10,000 veterans who returned home after service and found good paying job in a growing industry right here in America. Point number two, in these tough economic times that bring some potential good news, many wind projects have completed the state's industrial siting act process and if they are built, and if is the key thing you've been hearing about all day in competition, over the project's lifetimes, it will provide $10 billion in new investment, thousands of new jobs, and over $1.5 billion in the combination of new sales and use, property, and the current $1 per megawatt hour wind excise tax. Point number three goes to competition. And I'm not going to add, uh, I'm going to add something new here and not repeat. Uh, but in response to the production tax credit and the investment tax credit for mostly solar takes use of that, uh, the point lost uh, in previous testimony is it's not just Wyoming companies who utilize that, it's wind developers in New Mexico and Montana, it's solar in Arizona and Nevada, our neighbors in Colorado, everyone's using that. So we're still competing against the same projects who have the same federal tax credit, whether you like it or not, we're still competing. Competition is the theme. Our members want to build here in Wyoming. We are not complaining that, it, that something is unfair. We want to build our projects. Um, if we don't win that power purchase agreement because the taxation structure goes too high, including what is being considered today, and for the record, of course, our industry opposes this proposed legislation, we won't win that PPA and we won't build. And what is at risk is what we need to focus on. What is at risk are 17 years of $1 per megawatt hour under the current structure to try to gain three more to eliminate that grace period. Do we really wanna risk 17 to try to gain three? Do we wanna risk all the property taxes? Do we wanna risk all the sales and use taxes that, that lead to those billions? So Mr. that's Perry, what's in focus. And I'll conclude by just saying on land use, uh, yes, we, we lease out a large acreage of, of land, uh, but we end up using just one to 2% uh, when we're uh, finally cited our, our projects and 95% of the resulting land remains in agricultural and productive uh, use that's consistent with ag and ranching operations. So with that, I thank you again for the opportunity and stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Darren. Questions? Um, Representative Blackburn, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, sir, I, I believe you said that if this bill passes, you will not build. Is that correct? Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Representative Blackburn. No, that's exactly, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if this bill passes, it increases the taxes on wind and it makes us uncompetitive. Those prices get built into what we put in our bids in a multi-state regional re request for proposal process and we're competing. So it just decreases the likelihood we will win the PPA. You need to understand Representative Blackburn, if we do not win the PPA, we do not build. And we get, if we do not build, there is zero excise tax. There is zero property tax. There is zero sales and use tax. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Darren? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, sir, and your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your father's service. Yeah, thanks. 
Okay, next up, we're gonna go to Terry um, Wycom. Mr. Wycom, are you there? Terry, can you hear us? There you are. I think we see you, sir. Terry, can you hear us? We can't hear you yet, sir. Oh, it's connecting now. <coughs> your audio is. Hopefully this will be the trick that does it. Yeah, we still can't hear you, sir. For all the advantages of technology, sometimes we run into these situations. It's kind of clunky today. Yeah. It's still connecting, sir. I tell you what, sir, while we're waiting on um, your audio issues to get fixed, um, we're going to go to um, Ms. Stephanie Kessler. Ms. Kessler, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah, please go ahead and present. And uh, same time limit as everybody else, Ms. Kessler. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee for this time. I'm here representing the Wyoming Outdoor Council. And in the spirit of acknowledging veterans <coughs> today, I wanna do a shout out to my father who was a Colonel in the army during World War II and um, I am the person I am by growing up with a father who was an army colonel. Um, I would like to bring to your attention just um, a perspective that I haven't heard yet today. Uh, we are a conservation group and I certainly acknowledge and validate the concerns that we've heard from members of the public about issues related to our environment to our beautiful open spaces, our wildlife, our residential view sheds, and the scenic beauty of our state. Our members share those same values. But uh, what I caution this committee to think about is that you use the correct tool to address these issues. These are issues related to appropriate siting of these large scale renewable projects in the right place. We know there are some poster child projects out there that are not in the right place. And thus they've generated a lot of public concern and testimony that I've heard in three committees now in the last couple of months. But you can't take a hammer, the wrong tool, which may be taxation in this regard and hammer away and expect that that tool will address something when a different tool like a wrench is needed. In fact, we could still increase the taxes on this industry and they can still move forward and site in the wrong locations in conflict with our Wyoming values. There are some large scale renewable wind projects like the recent one in Converse County that is cited well and has gotten a lot of welcome in that community. So I encourage this committee to really think about what it is that you're trying to fix and use the right tool for it. And what this state needs is a more proactive, broad thinking approach about setting these facilities in the right locations and recognizing that they can match up with some of our values if they're put in the correct place. I'm gonna end with reading from a Star Tribune article. You may have heard that the state land board recently opposed leasing state lands for a wind project in Albany County. And one of the key proponents said in that debate, one of the key opponents rather to that wind facility said, there are proper locations to place power generation facilities and this is not one of them let's make sure that we're using the right tool to address the real problems with these large scale wind projects. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kessler. Any questions for the Wyoming Outdoor Counselor, Council and Ms. Kessler? I've not seen any. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate your testimony and your time. And I suspect we'll see you on the next one also. Um, Mr. Weekham. Terry, are you there? Can you hear me now? Hello, Terry. 
Can you hear me, sir? I don't suspect so. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of do a last call for Mr. Ed Ernst, Loretta Anison, Kirk Stone, or James Lee, or Christopher Rumpel. I don't have any of those people in my waiting room. My names that I can recognize them by. Okay, Mr. Weakum, Terry, can you hear us? We still can't hear you, sir. All right, unfortunately, it is uh, the bummer of technology and, and hopefully you get that worked out. Um, is there anybody else in the room that would like to testify in regards to the proposed legislation? Not seeing anybody jumping up. All right. Okay, so uh, committee members, I'm going to close public testimony at this time. And uh, what's your pleasure, committee? Do pass. Moved by Senator Case. Is there a second? Second by Representative Clausen. Committee, any um, any amendments, testimony, or anything in that regard? Senator Scott, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to set just a little context for what we're dealing with here. Uh, as I read the Craig report, we're going to have quite a bit of trouble uh, getting things balanced. I think we could uh, probably balance our budget by cutting, but I think if we did, we'd cut out enough things that people really need that our voters would be looking for a new legislature. Um, and specifically, uh, having dealt with the Medicaid program recently, which is a major source of our spending in the, in the healthcare area, um, that program is structured such there is a federal minimum that you have to have uh, in order to participate in the program at all. Uh, if we cut as much as I think we might need to in Medicaid, we would run the, a very real risk of going below that and that would have disastrous consequences. Um, so you have to be aware of that. I will also say that in my experience in the legislature, I came in at the tail end of the effort to establish the severance tax we've got now. Uh, and then I served on the revenue committee uh, when we put in the tier system of taxation we've got now. And the testimony we've heard today from industry and, and the people supporting the industry Over the reminds me very much of the testimony we heard on those issues back in that day. Um, they're talking about uh, just contracts going on, on cents per megawatt hour uh, as opposed to going on uh, cents per barrel or, or cents per MCF, uh, but it's very, very similar. Uh, I would say to the committee that you can get too greedy in any one of these things and eliminate industry. Our brethren up in Montana proved that in the Powder River Basin. They raised their severance tax to almost twice ours and uh, we got the business that they might have gotten, uh, and it's been very beneficial to Wyoming. Um, what I'm thinking on this is that we're going to need to have a wide perspective, a wide variety of options at the next session, uh, because if we eliminate all the ones where industry comes crying, all that's going to be left is general taxes on the people who can't afford to hobby, hire a lobbyist and we are elected to represent them. Uh, so we need, I think, a wide variety before us. For that reason, I think it would be wise for us to send this bill forward so it's on the menu of all the things we might do and then we can compare all those things and I think we've got to make major reductions in some of our expenditures 
before we can justify any tax. So at this point, I would urge us to vote for this bill, but recognize this is just the first step and we need a, a wide menu of choices at the session. Senator Nethercott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't support this legislation. I, I think it's pulling the rug out of industry. I think we've heard from industry experts and those that support the industry and service the industry that um, this is a very dangerous time. And I'm not advocating that this exemption should never be removed and that we shouldn't analyze the way that we tax wind. Uh, but I just think this tool at this time is wrong. Um, however, that said, I wanna make sure that if this bill does pass, that it's passed with a way that protects those projects currently underway, recognizing we do need those um, revenues coming in and recognizing that we wanna send a clear message that Wyoming is a place to do business that is stable, reliable, consistent, and is a foundation for business to plan and budget accordingly and not take knee jerk reactions when we hit a hard spot um, and have other people pay for, for our decisions. Uh, so with that, I would move uh, for the, to adopt the staff comment for the recommendation to grandfather in those projects currently underway. And I think that's on page two of the bill. Second by Chairman Landon. Any discussion in regards to the proposed amendment to the bill? Seeing none. All those, and sensing you're willing, you're ready to vote, all those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand in front of the camera. Oh, sorry, my camera's not on. You do need to have your camera on, Representative Duncan, if you do plan on voting. I'm trying. All those opposed, please raise your hand in front of your camera. Okay, that amendment has been adopted. Any other amendments in regards to the proposed legislation? Seeing none, no other discussion. Mr. Hewitt, please call the roll. <laughs> Jim, on also 182. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Motion is on 21 LSO 182, working draft 0 0.3 as amended. Senator Case. Aye. Senator Nethercott. No. Senator Schuler. No. Senator Scott. Aye. Representative Blackburn. Aye. Representative Lawson. Aye. Representative Clem. Aye. Representative Clifford. No. Representative Duncan. No. Representative Ayer. No. Representative Furphy. Adamantly, no. Adamantly. Co-Chairman Landon. Aye. Chairman Lindholm. Aye. Mr. Chairman, I count seven ayes. The motion is adopted. Okay. Um, so that, uh, that bill will be sponsored by the committee and moving forward to this next legislative session. Uh, committee, it just so happens to be 12.07, and we weren't planning on going for lunch today, although we all knew it was going to happen. <laughs> so um, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and take a lunch break until 1 o'clock. Um, at such time, when we come back, we'll be taking up um, the customer-generated electricity systems that is being uh, brought to us by Representative Ayer. At that time, uh, we'll take up uh, that bill and public testimony. Um, for those of you that are listening in that we're expecting on testifying this morning, I apologize. Uh, but such things, we don't want to. We don't want to have people not testify um, and not have their voices heard. So this is an important part of our process. And sometimes we work late. We work a little late and long. Uh, really appreciate everybody's patience in this regard. And uh, we'll see everybody after lunch break. And Mr. Chairman, a new YouTube link. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Talbot. I'm sorry, what was that? There will be a new YouTube link for those afternoon watchers. That's right. I always forget to mention that. There will be a new YouTube link for the late YouTube link for the late watchers. Um, also, everybody, please turn off your cameras.